to day number 25 of Ramadan 360 uh, with the Prophets and Devils private course that we have uh, going on now for the 25th day. Today, we're going to be joined by Sheikh Omar Suleiman, inshallah ta'ala. I'm very excited for his talk today. And there's that promising sound, alhamdulillah, on uh, the story of Isa and Maryam al Islam. I hope that you guys are just as hyped as I am uh, to continue our journey and especially for the last week or less than a week we have left to continue it. Alhamdulillah, it's been a huge pleasure to have my guests hosts on over the past couple of days uh, showing you that representation that we have from our volunteer body um, and you guys will inshallah see a lot more of them if you are to join us for our virtual class experiences that we've been mentioning Alhamdulillah throughout the month. I do want to shout out really quickly and thank once again Human Concern International who've been doing a beautiful job of partnering with us uh, throughout this month who helped to make this whole series possible. Please do support their amazing campaigns. Uh, they have a campaign going on right now for Yemen. They have a campaign going on for uh, COVID-19 in India, which is in a crisis point. So please do support the link that you see in your description, humanconcern.org slash al maghrib and you can uh, send your donations to the area of the highest need, inshallah. Yes, Rishad, uh, Dr. Omar Suleiman, inshallah, is joining us in one second. Uh, he does not need any introduction, so I'm going to save him the grief of that. But alhamdulillah, it's such a pleasure to have him as a leader in our community, starting out as an instructor with the Maghrib Institute, and now the founder uh, and the CEO of Yakin and the president of Yakin Institute for Islamic Research, mashallah. It's such a pleasure. Also, I, I love seeing the, the names and the, the people coming in. Everyone, please do turn on your cameras. Let's greet him with a full screen. Uh, that's something that a lot of the instructors have have commented that they've loved seeing all the students that are actually engaging and consistently, uh, you know, speaking to them in the actual experience as well. So, mashallah, that not only are you receiving an amazing experience, but you're giving that to your instructors as well. And how amazing is that, uh, mashallah? We're nearing the end. We're at, you know, 25th day, 26th night coming up tonight. Uh, we have an amazing program uh, to kind of preemptively get you guys all revved up for the 27th night tomorrow. So, please make sure that you do tune in for Al Maghrib's. Shukr webinar that's kicking off. Sheikh Omar Suleiman, Sheikh Suleiman Hani, who was with us yesterday, uh, Sheikh Saad Saslim, Musada Zaymiya Zubair, a lot of your favorites are going to be back with you, inshallah. Um, so please make sure that you do uh, get registered. It's not going to be on the Ramadan 360 portal. It's not going to be linked here. So please make sure that you don't miss out. And just a heads up for those of you who are watching Ramadan 360 consistently on Facebook and YouTube, uh, we will not be live across every every Facebook and YouTube uh, you know, platform normally, just like the last webinar. So you will have to make sure that if you are not registered for Ramadan 360, uh, you head over to Ramadan360.org and uh, make sure you get that registration complete so that you can access it on Zoom. And of course, you'll have access to all of the, uh, the, the resources as well. Um, inshallah. The, for Sarah from Melbourne is asking if the Shukr webinar will be recorded. Uh, the recording, I think, will be available for a bit after on social media, but keep in mind it's going to be kind of late by then because the uh, webinar itself is going to be kind of focused, obviously, in the last 10 nights in the Ibadah, so you want to catch it live if you can. Uh, the reminders are very short, so that's what I find really beneficial, is just gem after gem after gem. Such a variety of instructors. Alhamdulillah, we have 12 instructors joining us tomorrow, uh, so you get a chance to, to, to taste the flavor of the teaching style of a lot of our other instructors as well. So once again, that is going to be on almagrib.org slash webinar. Give me one second. Um, I'll be right back with you guys. Uh, so give me a minute. I'm just going to make sure that we are all nice and set and ready to go uh, for the session itself before we kick off. And I'll be right back with you guys. So just bear with me. Um, I'm going to make sure that you guys can uh, not look at a bl blank screen. We'll be starting in just one minute, inshallah. Bismillah. Alrighty, Alhamdulillah. It looks like Sheikh is joining us in just a little bit, uh, in just a minute or two, inshallah. Uh, to those who are still chiming into the chat and saying your salams as you're coming in, welcome, welcome. Um, what do you 
call it uh, Jazak Mulher for joining us for day number 25 for the session today, inshallah, and uh, for saying your salams. Please again, join us on screen so that we can welcome the Sheikh uh, with all of us on, inshallah, and show him the full Ramadan 360 experience. Uh, I love to see all the, the cameras that are already on. Khadija, uh, Rizlane, Haifa, Saeed from France, Samreen, Sama, Rima, Shazia, mashallah, Saira. I love that awesome sauce. Jazak Mulher, everyone who's uh, turning on your camera still. Gina, of course, our OG. Um, and Jazak Malakir to those who can't and are hoping to, and I will stay inshallah engaged in the chat. I love to hear uh, all, all the amazing questions that you guys were submitting yesterday for the session. Um, and Alhamdulillah, I'm so glad that you got so many questions answered with Sheikh Suleiman Hani as we were closing off with our Q&A yesterday. Um, inshallah, you can look forward to Sheikh Suleiman Hani coming back for not only uh, a Ramadan 360 reflection session, so a Quranic reflection session, but also he's going to be our final session uh, as we close off our Ramadan 360 programming, but it's a good thing because what Sheikh Salman Hani is really good at is helping you set goals and helping you set uh, yourself up for success post Ramadan. I still remember the lecture that he gave as we were closing off Ramadan 360 in 2020, and he gave so many practical tips uh, for how to make the most of your year and how to continue the amazing habits that you built up. So make sure that you don't start slacking on the last days, to, that you don't start jumping straight into Eid prep, that you do inshallah join us because I found that so, so beneficial. Alhamdulillah, I had to go back to that session and learn from it a couple of times. So it'll help you get over that, you know, post Eid kind of slump that sometimes we go into uh, when we're trying to kind of, you know, recover from, from, from month of Ramadan and that relaxation mindset that we get into, it brings you right back into that energized and motivated state as a Muslim, alhamdulillah. Um, so with that being said, inshallah, we'll be joining, uh, we'll be joined by Sheikh Amr Salaman in just one minute as we kick off day number 25 of Ramadan 360. For those who are still joining us because we've doubled in numbers since I've opened, um, please uh, do chime into the chat if you're coming in from Facebook and YouTube. Uh, let us know where you're coming in from. If you are, of course, on Zoom, you guys are nice and familiar with the whole setup. So make sure that you have changed your names to reflect your country uh, or your city. And as, as, as much as you can, please do try to join us on screen to welcome the Sheikh, inshallah ta'ala. Um, for any comments that I see that I can't, uh, uh, you know, respond to, inshallah, we'll drop them into the chat in just one second, um, if it's more logistical related, but alhamdulillah, I see that the sheikh is with us for today's session, um, so I'm super excited for us to kick off the lecture, and then, of course, you guys already know the drill, save your questions, inshallah, we'll kick those off, inshallah, at the end of the session. Um, I love all the hype in the chat, everyone, let's calm down, <laughs> and let's get ready, inshallah, to benefit. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, sheikh Amr Salaman, how are you doing today? Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah wa Alhamdulillah, good. How's everyone? Um, it looks like everyone's a little bit too excited. I think we need to, I don't know who, who's not fasting here, mashallah. <laughs> too much energy in the chat. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. But it's lovely to that, see. We need that, that energy to carry us through the last parts of Ramadan, inshallah. Exactly, exactly. It's the, it's the young energy. It's that hype, mashallah. I love to see it. A lot of times people are exhausted from their ibadah. I know a lot of us are waking up a lot later in the day, but I love to see that everyone's, mashallah, ready to go. So bismillah, sheikh. I'm going to pass it off to you for your lecture uh, on Isa. And we'll come back to you at the end for questions. Jazakumullah khair. All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So it's Friday and it's Jum'ah, just finished Jum'ah. So I, I'm, I'm going to feed off of your energy, inshallah ta'ala, to, to get the boost that I need, inshallah ta'ala, to be able to, to do this properly, inshallah, and do this, this subject justice. And subhanAllah, it is a subject that um, is so near and dear to my heart. And one of the reasons is that uh, Maryam alayhi salam in particular is so underrated in her virtue, just as, as a person, right? And, and I often talk about how we treat Maryam alayhi salam like she's a comma, right? Between the uh, dua of uh, the family of Imran, Imran and his wife, Hanna bint Faqud, and then Maryam was kind of just this, this comma, and then comes Isa alayhi salam. But how special Maryam alayhi salam is, her status as a woman of perfection and as an example for all of those who claim devotion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ She was from those who were deeply devoted. And Allah azza wa jalla did not use the female qanitat. Allah used qanitin, which includes males and females, to say that Maryam alayhi salam is a legend and an example for anyone that seeks to be a person of ibadah that seeks to be a person of worship, this is an example for you to cling towards. 
So the story of Maryam alayhi salam, I want to frame it actually in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first gave it to us. And it's hard to do Maryam and Isa. So I'll try my best inshallah ta'ala to do, uh, to do both of them with Allah ta'ala. Um, but it is very hard. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about sort of the coming of Isa alayhi salam and what that represents and some of the wisdoms that the ulama mentioned of the dua and the way that the dua was taking place. We know that Allah gives us multiple examples in the Quran of people that make dua for something from Allah, for a child from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something of that sort. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them more than what they ask for. And so, for example, Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was not granted a child until his 60s with Ismail alayhi salam, and then suddenly, you know, they had Ismail alayhi salam, they thought Ismail was the answer to their dua. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the angels to give him the bushra of Ishaq alayhi salam, of Isaac. 13 years later, it's like, wait a minute, we already had our child, alhamdulillah. And of course, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam had to sacrifice him, but he thought that Ismail was the only answer to his dua. He, of course, was the answer to his dua, but he thought he was the only answer to his dua. Then, Basharnahu bi Ishaq, we gave him the glad tidings of Ishaq. And by the way, not just Ishaq, but min wara Ishaq Ya'qub. You're going to also live to see your grandchildren. And your grandson is going to be this amazing person, Ya'qub alayhi salam, too. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving them that bushra and the glad tiding was increased for them, right? And so that's one, right? Now, there was a pause, though, where Ibrahim alayhi salam was given the glad tiding of Ismail alayhi salam. There's the happiness, and then suddenly he has to sacrifice Ismail, right? And then comes Ishaq. When it comes to other prophets, you find a similar trend. But it's done in a way, subhanAllah, where each one of them has their unique circumstances. And so in the case of the parents of Maryam alayhi salam, this is the family of Imran. And in the, in the situation of the family of Imran, Imran and his wife, uh, Hanna bint Fakhud, are unable to have a child. And Imran is considered the leader of Bani Israel. He's considered the leader of the righteous some of the ulama mentioned that he himself was a prophet, that Imran is actually considered from the Anbiya. There's debate about whether or not he himself is considered a prophet or whether he was just an imam, a righteous man from Bani Israel that was leading the community of worshippers at that time. And as Imran and Hanna, Hanna bint Faqud are looking out, subhanAllah, to the, the, the darkness of the world and the particular corruption that has overcome Bani Israel, they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a child. And the particular ask is attached to the intention. And this is actually a powerful lesson in dua, that when you are studying the duas of the prophets, their asks are never isolated from the intention. Like, why do you want what you want? Okay. Uh, why did Ibrahim Islam want children? Uh, why is Zakariya asking for a child? Why is Imran and his wife, in this case, Hanna bint Faqud, asking for uh, a child. And, you know, it, it, she, she turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as she is longing and as she's asking and Imran is making dua, suddenly she becomes pregnant. And she was not pregnant in her young age. And so it was an amazing feat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that she became pregnant in her old age. And as she's pregnant, um, the people, the worshippers of Bani Israel are celebrating because there's hope, right? They know this is a miraculous baby that she's pregnant with because of the circumstances of it. And subhanAllah, you can imagine, you know, the, the happiness that they're feeling, the happiness that they are, um, that they're experiencing, the happiness that the whole community is experiencing as a result of this. And then suddenly, subhanAllah, uh, Imran dies. Imran alayhi salam dies. And, and by the way, I want you to sort of understand the turn of events here in, in regards to the community, right? A happy couple that is about to be blessed with a child suddenly becomes a situation of a widow that's going to have an orphan. SubhanAllah. Of course, we know that the situation of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam was that you know his mother Amina became pregnant with him. And then Abdullah, uh, you know, uh, the father of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam and Amina, they were only married for, you know, some say a few days, a few weeks before he went on his journey to Asham. So they just got married, young couple, Abdullah makes his way to Asham on the trade route, the annual trade route. He dies along the way. She found out she was pregnant when he left. So he did not even get to enjoy the news that the Prophet ﷺ, that her that his, his wife was pregnant with the Prophet. 
So in the case of Imran and, uh, and, and Hanna, everyone is celebrating. And then suddenly, wow, you know, like what a turn of events. How do we understand the wisdom? We don't. By the way, till now, we don't know the wisdom of Imran dying before uh, the birth of Maryam, alayhi salam. But certainly there is a wisdom. Perhaps it was the unique way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to elevate the, the wife of Imran. Perhaps it was the catalyst for the dua that would come from Zakaria alayhi salam, right? Allah knows best, but the point is, is that when Imran dies and Hanna is left in the situation where she's now going to give birth to an orphan, she's a widow and she's going to give birth to an orphan, she still turns that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she says, Rabbi inni nadartu laka ma fi batni muharrara fataqabbal minni innaka anta samir alim. She turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she says, listen, ya Allah, I've dedicated what is in my child, what is in my womb. It's going to be dedicated to you. So she was brought closer to Allah as a result of the tragedy that gripped her. She promises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this baby that is in my stomach is going to be for you, dedicated to you. And the implication of that is dedicated to the temple. Now, the temple being here, Al-Aqsa, uh, the area of Al-Aqsa, where the masjid, the place of worship, the place of sajda is. And of course, at this point now, as Bani Israel, uh, you know, worship within Masjid Al-Aqsa, they have prohibited women from worshiping in Al-Aqsa. So SubhanAllah, it's very interesting here because when she said that I have dedicated what is in my stomach to you, O Allah, uh, she means I want to dedicate this person to be a abid, to be a nabi, to be a worshiper, to be a prophet, right? And here it is, right, that as soon as the child is born, she looks at this baby and it's a girl. Now, was she disappointed because of some, you know, cultural expectations and implications of, oh, you know, we like boys, we don't like girls. Was it like a jahli type thing? Or was it the sadness at a jahli practice that would not have allowed for this baby to be what she had intended for it to be? And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she, when she quotes the Prophet sallallahu and says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, do not forbid ima Allah, masajid Allah, don't forbid the female servants of Allah from the houses of Allah. She mentions that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said or taught her that Bani Israel used to prohibit women from going to the masajid. SubhanAllah. So don't do like Bani Israel in prohibiting the women from going to the, the, the female servants of Allah from going to the houses of Allah. And so she has this baby and she says that uh, you know, Rabbi inni wada'tuha untha, oh Allah, I've given birth to a girl, untha, and a boy is not like a girl, wa inni samaytuha Maryam. Now, when she says, and I have named her Maryam, that means that there's something special about the name Maryam, right? Because it, it can't, you know, in the case of Zakaria alayhi salam, Allah will name his son Yahya, right? Will name his son Yahya, because there's a meaning to Yahya alayhi salam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to name him Yahya for those reasons. When she says, what inni samaytuha Maryam, was it just because she thought Maryam was a cute name? Like, you know, while, while I have a girl and I've got to figure it out, let me go ahead and call her Maryam, right? Or was it because Maryam was the name of her mom or the name of her aunt? The name Maryam, the roots of it, uh, M, when you go back to the Aramaic language, some of this, and, and scholars have debated this over centuries, by the way, what her name actually means. But M, when you look at it, is a shortened version of Emma. Mari, is the version of Rabbi. So it is Amatu Rabbi, Amatullah, basically the female servant of Allah. Amatullah is like the female version of Abdullah. Okay. So I have named her the handmaid of the Lord. I have named her the servant, the female servant of the Lord. SubhanAllah. To say that I am insisting. So those of you that are named Maryam, now you know that the, the, the uh, and I actually see Amatullah. I just saw Amatullah. To, <laughs> SubhanAllah, just, I looked at the chat for a moment. So Amatullah, Maryam, Maryam, Amatullah. And so uh, now you know your, what your name means or where it comes from. There is actually a special meaning to it. And that seems to be the most correct version, especially when you take into consideration some of the biblical sources about what she intended with Maryam. So I have named her Maryam, meaning I am going to insist that she's going to be a abida, that she's going to be a worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if the place of worship to Allah has been taken away from her. Now, Zakaria alayhi salam assumed the guardianship of, uh, of Maryam. And there was, this is one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you know, sent the, his love to this family is that when she gave birth to Maryam, 
people wanted to take care of Maryam out of their love for Hanna and Imran. So the community still felt an, 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 an affection towards Imran, alayhi uh, salam, or rahimahullah, or radiallahu anhu, right? I mean, who could be a prophet of Allah, an imam of the community. And they felt an affection towards her. And she's a widow now, and she's giving birth to this orphan girl. So they actually had to cast lots uh, to say who would take the guardianship of this girl. And Zakaria alayhi salam, he said, listen, I am the husband of her, of her aunt. Uh, and at the same time, I'm the nearest person to her. I will be more mindful of her. I'll take care of her. So when they sent the reeds into the river, all of them sank to the bottom except for that of Zakaria alayhi salam. So that's, that was also a means of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directing her to the guardianship of Zakaria alayhi salam. فَتَقَبَّلَهَا رَبُّهَا بِقَبُولٍ حَسَنًا وَأَنْبَتَهَا نَبَاتًا حَسَنًا The scholars mentioned that Allah mentions that He accepted her, تَقَبَّلَهَا before He mentioned the kafala, the guardianship of Zakariya alayhi salam. Like Allah accepted the intention that she had for her child and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted Maryam alayhi salam. And this is very important by the way because what you learn is the importance of the dua of the parents for children even before the parents have their children. <laughs> Right, the intention that you have for your child is so important. And by the way, you find Ibrahim Isa making dua for his children to be establishers of prayer before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even gave him the glad tidings that he'd have a child. So, like, you know, he asked Allah for children and children muqim as salah that would be establishers of the prayer. So here Allah accepted Maryam alayhi salam, meaning the dua of her mother for her. And of course, wa inni u'idhuha bika wa dhurriyatuha min ash-shaytan rajim. How amazing of a woman, subhanAllah. She sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shaytan. And the Prophet sallallahu said that every baby, when they are born, the shaytan pokes at them and says, you and I are going to have a long journey together. You know, and so the, the shaytan pokes at you as soon as you come into this world and says, you're, you're mine now, right? Now the journey of me trying to lead you astray starts. Now that flesh has come into, you know, upon the soul, now I'm going to lead you astray. And that distresses the children, except for Maryam and Isa alayhi salam, because of the dua of Hanna bin Tufaqud, that they were spared even from that, from the shaytan, even from the taunting of the shaytan at the time of birth, they were spared. So Allah taqabbalaha, Allah accepted her, and Zakaria alayhi salam kafalaha. Zakaria alayhi salam took her under his guardianship. The Prophet ﷺ said Zakaria ﷺ was a najar, he was a carpenter. So Zakaria wants to fulfill the wishes of the mother of Maryam. She wants to have a place for her to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a place where women are not allowed. Zakaria ﷺ says, you know what? I'm going to build her. I'm a carpenter. I will build her a place in the masjid just for her. And no one can enter upon her. And subhanAllah, he goes there and he builds out of the intention, and this is also the nobility of Zakaria, by the way, in wanting to fulfill the, the, the wish of uh, Hanna bin Tufaqud, let me build for her a place, and he builds for her a beautiful mihrab, a place for her to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and only Zakaria alayhi salam goes to visit her, and goes to check up on her, and goes to take her food, and goes to take her drink. Zakaria alayhi salam, at this time, you know, there is now a community issue. <laughs> Imran and Zakaria, were the two, the two men that were taking care of Bani Israel, the shepherds of Bani Israel. Imran has died. Zakaria is not getting younger. Zakaria alayhi salam is now a 90-year-old man. And Bani Israel usually had multiple prophets at a time. Not one prophet at a time, multiple prophets at a time. So Zakaria alayhi salam is looking around. Okay, now we have a problem. Who's going to succeed in prophethood? Who's going to lead the community at this point? And... He's doing, you know, he, he's he's pleased with the with with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the decree of Allah, but it is very clear that Zakaria alayhi salam now is getting worried. Now he's going to check up on Maryam alayhi salam, and every time he comes to Maryam, he finds her in, in ibadah. Every single time he comes to her day and night, she's in salah. So she is growing up with a deep attachment to her prayer, right? And you think about the notions of i'tikaf and qiyam right now, right? Every time Zakaria Islam comes to her, he finds her in ibadah. So it's not like she's waiting and she wants to have a conversation. No, she's there. She wants to have ibadah. And Zakaria Islam is also noticing now something very strange. Every time he comes to her, he finds that the food and drink is already there. 
Now, it could just be what? That someone else was kind enough in the masjid to start bringing her food and drink, right? Except it's food out of season. <laughs> so things that should not be appearing in this season, appearing in this season. So clearly, either someone has a really good refrigerator and, and has figured something out from an agricultural perspective or storage of food, or this is miraculous. And it is miraculous, of course. So clearly, something is happening here. So Zakaria salam, one day he comes and he's, he waits on Maryam salam, to finish her ibadah. He says, Ya Maryam, anna laki hada? Where are you getting this from? Qalat huwa min indillah. She said, it's from Allah. Inna Allah yarzuqu man yasha bi ghayri hisab. Allah gives what he wants to whom he wants without any limit. Okay? What was Maryam telling Zakaria salam? Look, I know you want a child. I know you yourself are hoping, looking to this heavens for something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask. Go ahead and ask him. You never know, right? Allah per, per, is making this food out of nothing, right? <laughs> He's sending me food and drink and nourishment out of nothing. Go ahead and ask him. That's what she's implying. And that's why the ayah says, هُنَالِكَ دَعَى زَكَرِيَ رَبَّ It was at that moment that Zakariya a.s. went to the corner of Al-Aqsa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberate it from the occupiers. Allahumma ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberate it. You can't talk about Al-Aqsa now and, and, and not think about the oppression in that very same place right now. May Allah liberate it. Zakariya a.s. takes to the corner of Al-Aqsa and he calls out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ نِدَاءً خَفِيَّةً this is one of the most beautiful and poetic verses of the Quran. Poetry, not in sha'ir, but like it's just, it flows so beautifully. Nada rabbahu nida. He called out, he shouted out a shout, khafiyah, that no one could hear. <laughs> SubhanAllah, it's like you hear nada nida. It's like you're thinking of a person crying out so loudly, but actually no one could hear it except Allah. SubhanAllah. So the crying of the heart, the shouting of the heart, the yearning for his Lord. And he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbi inni wahana al-adhmu minni wa shta'ala ra'su shayba wa lam akun bi du'aika rabbi shaqiyya. Ya Allah, I'm old. My hair is gray. My bones are weak. I'm old on the outside. I'm old on the inside. And I don't, you know, I, I don't really know how to start this conversation with you, Ya Allah, except to say, I know that I'm an old man. I recognize what I'm about to ask you is improbable in terms of the circumstances. I'm a 90-year-old man. And I get it. I'm not just a 90-year-old man. I'm a 90-year-old man that looks and feels like a 90-year-old man. Hair is all gray. Bones are weak. I don't have anything left in me. But yeah, Allah, I'm just calling out to you. And inni wahna al-adhmu minni wa shta'ala ra'su shayba. But at the same time, you know what? Walam akun bi du'a'ika rabbi shaqiyya. I've never made du'a to you before and been deprived. I've never felt deprived when I called upon you. SubhanAllah, like, why would I feel, why would I feel embarrassed and shy to call upon you? When you've never let me down in the past. This is such a beautiful way to approach Allah. You know, some people approach Allah in dua like, Ya Allah, it's me again. Same dua. I know I made this dua last year. I've been making it for a long time. It's still not happening, Ya Allah. I don't know how to, how to come to terms. No, it's like, Ya Allah, lam akun bi dua'ika rabbi shaqiyya. You never let me down before. And you're calling upon a Lord who's shy. Allah is shy, Right? Uh, when a servant raises his hands, especially a righteous servant, raises his hands and calls upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is shy. And he says, And I'm just worried about the descendants. I'm worried about those that come after me. In one qira'a, There's no one to succeed me. So I'm just worried, ya Allah. I'm worried that people won't worship you. Right? So I'm not worried about, you know, my name being remembered. I'm not worried about anything in terms of worldly legacy, I'm worried about you, Ya Allah, right? And that's the Prophet Sallallahu when he called out to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala in Badr. And he said, if this group of people is killed, you're not going to be worshipped, O Allah. I want you to be worshipped, Ya Allah. Uh, this is my concern. That was Ibrahim Islam's concern. So Ya Allah, I'm worried. And I'm looking out and I don't see anyone to, to assume the role. And and not only am I old, but my wife never could give birth in the first place, even when we were young. But then he says, فَهَبَلِي مَنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيَّ But Ya Allah, grant me a successor. Grant me someone to carry on this mission. يَرِثُنِي وَيَرِثُمْ مِنْ آلِ يَعْقُوبِ SubhanAllah, this is a beautiful connection, by the way, between the story here, all the way back to Ibrahim Aislam and Ya'qub. 
Ibrahim Islam was just asking Allah for a child. Allah blessed him with the Qurrata Ain, with seeing the beautiful Yaqub Islam. SubhanAllah, the man who exemplifies beautiful patience, uh, his grandfather saw him. Ibrahim Islam met him and saw him and loved him. So he's saying, Yarithuni wa yarithu min Adi Yaqub. Let him inherit from me, inherit from Adi Yaqub, the family of Yaqub. Who is Yaqub? All of Bani Israel comes from Yaqub, right? All of Yaqub. So Ishaq, Yaqub, and then all of Bani Israel comes from Ya'qub So let him inherit from me and inherit from the best of what Bani Israel has. Okay? Meaning all of the good qualities that you would want of ilm, of knowledge, and taqwa, piety, akhlaq, character, righteousness. Ya Allah, put it all in this child. Make him not just better than me, but the best of what Bani Israel has seen. Yarithuni wa yarithu min al Ya'qub. Waj'alhu rabbi radiya. And let him be pleasing to you, O Allah. I, you know, that's what I want. I want him to be pleasing to you. Subhanallah, he 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 was just making the dua, and in the middle of his dua, Ya Zakariya inna nubashiruka bi ghulam in ismuhu Yahya lam naj'a lahu min qablu samiyya. The angels called him and said, Zakariya, stop there. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a message for you. I give you the glad tidings of a child. I've already named the child for you, Yahya. Okay. I've never given that name to anyone before. He's going to have the best of all these qualities. I'm going to make him an incredible child to you. I'm going to make him a scholar of the Torah. I'm going to make him the greatest scholar of the Torah. I'm going to make him a judge. I'm going to give him empathy that no one's ever seen before. I'm going to see him, give him modesty that no one has ever seen before. I'm going to give him all of these qualities. You didn't even get to the point where you started asking for those qualities. You didn't even ask for a name. You didn't even ask. I mean, I'm giving you everything customized. Here's Yahya alayhi salam. And a the way Allah praises Yahya alayhi salam, by the way, is, is, is enormous. It's spectacular. And Yahya alayhi salam was the teacher of Isa alayhi salam for a very long time. People forget that, that until the age of 30 years old, the Nabi was Yahya. And Isa alayhi salam was following Yahya alayhi salam as his sheikh. And they were brothers who loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and brothers that strove for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah granted him Yahya alayhi salam. Now I'm going to I know I'm running out of time, subhanAllah, but I'm going to get back to this as quickly as I can, inshallah, ta'ala. just the wisdom of all of this, right? So Allah blesses Zakaria, alayhi salam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, three days, you can't talk to anyone. All you can do is praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala three days and three nights. فَأَوْحَى إِلَيْهِمْ أَنْ سَبِّحُوا بُكْرَةً وَعَشِيَةً So, Allah, so, so Zakaria, alayhi salam, was just giving them signs. They would talk to Zakaria, alayhi salam, and he couldn't speak for three days, an oath of silence, but they see the joy in his face, and Zakaria, alayhi salam, is saying, you know, he's pointing to the sky. He's telling them, make tasbih. You know, he's doing the signals of dua. So they know that something great has happened to him. And they used to take oaths of silence. That was their fasting at the time, right? They used to take oaths of silence. So story should be over now, right? Imran, alayhi salam, died. Hinnab bin Tufaqud, alayhi salam, was blessed with Maryam, alayhi salam, a perfect girl, a perfect woman. She dedicated her to the temple. She has that. The story should be now, right, that, you know, at this point, Yahya alayhi salam is just going to be the person that is going to carry on the mission. But what happens? SubhanAllah. At that point, Maryam alayhi salam went out to the east. She used to go towards Beit Lahem, towards Bethlehem. And the scholars say that this was the time that she would leave the masjid, the time of the month that she could not be in the masjid. But what would she do? She'd still go and she'd watch the sunrise outside of Jerusalem and she'd remember Allah. So even when she could not, and this is a lesson, by the way, to those sisters that can't do particular ibadat sometimes, what did Maryam alayhi salam do? She did the ibadat that she still could. Tadabbur, tafakkur, dhikr, contemplation, remembrance. She would go out and she'd watch the sunrise and watch the sunset and remember Allah there. And then Allah sends her Jibreel alayhi <laughs> salam. You know how you told Zakaria alayhi salam, in Allah yarzuqu man yasha bi ghayri hisab? Allah is about to send you more than food and drink without means. Uh, and so she's out in the middle of nowhere and this beautiful man approaches her. Maryam alayhi salam does not look at Jibreel alayhi salam, this perfect, beautiful man, and with a, with, with a smile on her face say, Salaamu alaykum. No. She goes, Stay back 
I seek refuge in Allah from you. If you have any decency or fear in Allah, turn around, go away. <laughs> SubhanAllah. That's like, if you, if you think because of how you look and you think because of your appearance, you're going to put some moves on me and you're going to flirt with me or you're going to, no, 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 go away. I'm not interested. Fear Allah. SubhanAllah, right away. She doesn't know it's Jibreel Islam. She thinks it's just a super handsome man that's coming to, to, to talk to her in the middle of nowhere. When she did that, what happens? The Jibreel Islam said, Don't worry, I'm just a messenger of Allah coming to give you the glad tidings of a, of a child. Sure, yeah, whatever. Okay, go away, right? No. Why would Maryam believe him if it was just a man? Because at that point, what did the ulama say? Jibreel alayhi salam left his human form and, 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 and took on the angelic light. In tafadha Jibreel, subhanAllah, her words were so strong, Jibreel alayhi salam appeared at that point in some angelic form and then said, I'm coming to give you the glad tidings of a pure child. SubhanAllah, this is something that, you know, Allah sends Jibreel Islam to these people in a human form first because it would be too intimidating if it's an angelic form first. In the case of Maryam, because of her superior modesty, <laughs> she immediately rejected it. <clears throat> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned him back into angelic form, not in his full angelic form, uh, the, the ulama mentioned um, the, the, the light of Jibreel Islam and the voice of Jibreel Islam. So she, it's clear she's talking to an angel now. And I am giving you the glad tidings of a child as well. And she says, what? <laughs> I didn't ask Allah for a child. I've never been with a man. I, I'm confused, right? Why is this happening? And what's this going to do? This is I'm just going to be killed and scorned. And not only that, I'm going to bring shame to my family because... These people are not going to give me a chance, right? Ya Allah, I've never been touched by a man. What am I missing here? And what is the answer? The same answer to Zakaria Islam? Kedalik. Just because, just like that, it's going to happen. And subhanAllah, when Maryam alayhi salam is giving birth and the, the pregnancy starts there, you're already pregnant. It's not like this is sometime in the future. I'm here to give you the good news that you're pregnant. <laughs> And she's a teenage girl. She's a young girl. You know, um, she's 18 at the oldest. All right. When this happens to her and she goes through and she gives birth all by herself. The, the, her pregnancy coach and the one who delivers the baby is Jabir Ali Salam. There's no woman to help her. There's no man to help her. She's not even able, she doesn't want to tell anybody that she's pregnant. Right. She's, she doesn't know what to do. And when she gives birth to this child, and when she screams out and she's giving birth, and she says, Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasyan mansiya. I wish I was dead. I wish I would have died, and I wish I'd be forgotten. Now, Maryam Islam did not say this because of, um, you know, something dunyawi in its nature. She was worried about the scorn that this would bring. The scholars mentioned this is a very powerful point. The ahl deen to the people of religion. You know, subhanAllah, the fitna of a person of religion is that when a person of righteousness falls, then it makes righteousness and religiosity appear to be a mirage. So that's why the fitna of people that love their sheikh too much or there's a religious person in the family and the religious person in the family makes a mistake and falls from grace. The scholar falls from grace. The teacher falls from grace. The worshiper in the masjid falls from grace. And then that person that used to be warned by them and told about religion from them starts to think, is this religion stuff even real then? Like if that person fell, I'm questioning the deen at this point. Maryam alayhi salam was worried what? That they're going to mock her family, the family of prophethood. They're going to mock the people of deen. They're going to mock the ubad, the worshippers, the true worshippers. And that's going to be a harm to the deen and her reputation as well. And it's okay, subhanAllah, I mean, the the the... the the love of her reputation is not one of jah, prestige. It's, but I don't want to be slandered and scorned in this. I don't want to be remembered as the adulteress, right? Because when I go with this child, they're not going to let me speak. They're just going to kill me and kill the child, by the way, because of the laws of the Torah at that point, not the Torah, the laws of Bani Israel and Zina, they killed the fornic the adulterer, and they killed the baby. SubhanAllah, that was the, the, the something Allah did not send to them, but they innovated, that they would kill the adulterer and the adulteress, and they'd killed the child that was born as well. Okay, they had no mercy on the child. So this is one of the, the innovative shara'a, innovative legislations that they had. 
Jibreel alayhi salam calls out to her and says, what? Allah tahzani qad ja'ala rabbuki tahtaki sariya wa huzi ilayki bijir'i nakhlati tu saqita alayki rutaban janiyya fakuli wa shrabi wa qarri ayna. Jibreel alayhi salam says, don't be sad. Don't grieve. Don't grieve. Be happy. Allah is going to make a legend out of this child and he's going to make you to an even higher status. Don't grieve. It's okay. Things are going to be okay. Wait to see what happens next in the story. By the way, there's flooring, there's flowing water under you. Allah has placed this river under you. Allah has uh, placed this palm tree. You're under a palm tree. Shake the palm tree, O Maryam, and the dates will come falling on you. Now, next time you see a real palm tree, try to shake it and see if the dates fall on you. It's not going to work. <laughs> Even if you're a strong person. Uh, what was that a sign? Maryam, do your part. Allah will do his. All right. So shake the palm tree and Allah will do his part. And the dates will come falling on you. And then kuri washrabi wa qarri aina. Eat and drink. And let this be the coolness of your eyes. You know, we say make our spouses and offspring. Qurra ta'ayun. The coolness of our eyes. Look at this beautiful baby and let it be the coolness of your eyes. And then, And if anyone approaches you, say, I've taken a fast with my Lord. I'm not speaking to anyone today. So she goes to Al-Aqsa. All right, and I'll, I'll end off with this part, inshallah ta'ala. She carries the baby to Bani Israel. They were looking for her. At this point now, Allah has given her the courage and the confidence through Jibreel alayhi salam to, to, to actually go to them. And Al-Qurtubi rahimullah describes the, the scene. She gets to Al-Aqsa, وَأَلَفُّ مِنْ حَوْلِهَا And they come to her angry, she's, you know, in this situation, and they circle her. She sits on the ground. And she was breastfeeding Isa salam under her aba, under her, her garment. And what did they do? They look at her. يَا أُخْتَ هارون. What is this nastiness you've brought? The shame and disgrace that you have brought. Ya ukhta Harun, brother or sister of Aaron. Now, why? The ulama mentioned different reasons for this. She doesn't have a brother named Harun, but that Harun was looked at by Bani Israel as the prophet that fell from grace. So, like scorn, right? You are like Harun. You, you had such you had a family of prophethood, a family of righteous people. And you fell from grace. Ya ukhta Harun. Ma kana abu in wa ma kanat ummuki baghiya. Your father was not like this. Imran was not like this. Your mother was not an unchaste woman. What is wrong, woman? What is wrong with you? And they're scorning her and scorning her and scorning her. Maryam alayhi salam is sitting there. She knows Allah is going to help her. What happens? Isa alayhi salam. And yes, you can't, you can't. Imagine this because it's it's that special. Isa alayhi salam leaves the breastfeeding of his mother and he says, Inni Abdullah atani al kitab wa ja'alani nabiyya. <laughs> he starts to speak to them and says, I am the slave of Allah. He gave me the book and he made me into a prophet. Wa ja'alani mubarak and aina ma kunt. And I am not fariya. I'm not an illegitimate child that is a disgrace or scorn. Allah has made me blessed wherever I go. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted me the book and granted me the obligatory almsgiving and the enjoining good of good and forbidding of evil. And I am going to honor this woman. I'm going to honor this woman, Maryam. I'm going to honor my mother. And I will not be a deprived or a despicable human being. Subhanallah. Um, that moment, by the way, when Isa Islam returns to this earth, he will go to Al-Aqsa. He will chase a Dajjal and he will kill a Dajjal. And he will arrive at Al-Aqsa. On the Dome of the Rock right now, around the Dome of the Rock, you see calligraphy. The inscription is the story of the birth of Isa Islam from the Quran. <laughs> so he arrives in his resurrection, or actually he's not being resurrected because he did not die in his return. He arrives at Al-Aqsa and the writing of that story of his birth is there in that same spot. That is the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this majestic uh, story 
of the most perfect woman, Maryam alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, uh, would live with Yahya alayhi salam. They were brothers for Allah. They were prophets, anbiya. Um, uh, there's a beautiful hadith of Isa alayhi salam uh, giving Yahya alayhi salam nasiha, advice on how to give khutbah to the people in Al-Aqsa. And Yahya alayhi salam calling the people in Al-Aqsa. And Isa alayhi salam abided by him stood by him until Yahya alayhi salam was martyred, hence Yahya given eternal life through martyrdom because when those who are killed for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are killed, they are alive. Yahya was alive. And then Jibreel alayhi salam comes to Isa alayhi salam at the age of 30 years old and bestows upon him and nubuwa prophethood and risala and the message of Isa alayhi salam. And Isa alayhi salam for three years would be in this world, a prophet and a messenger and is raised to the heavens and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send him back as a member of this ummah of yours, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with Isa alayhi salam, and allow us to meet these luminaries and be with them in the highest level of the firdaus. Allahumma ameen. Wa jazakum Allah khayyam. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh Omar, for bringing that story so vividly to life. Uh, SubhanAllah, I think a lot of us have, have been just like almost watching a movie when we're, we're visualizing everything that you're, you've are you been uh, describing, alhamdulillah, over the past uh, 30, 40 minutes. Um, I'm going to give everyone an opportunity, inshallah, to type your questions in the chat. Give it a second while everyone finishes their, their, their commenting, and then please send them privately, inshallah. Just if you had sent it before, I saw a couple dozen come in uh, as the session was going on. Please do send them, inshallah, again. Again, and I see that, mashallah, hundreds of you have joined us uh, across social media as well. So welcome to uh, day 25 of Ramadan 360. We just covered the story of Isa and Maryam uh, with Sheikh Omar Salaman. Inshallah, we're going to be jumping into Q&A. So feel free to drop your questions into the chat as well. And uh, we have uh, after the session as well, Sheikh Saad Taslim coming in for an interactive reflection session uh, on a juz, uh, sorry, a verse from juz number 26 of the Quran as well. Uh, so I'm going to try to go through questions as much and as quickly as I can. Uh, but there's a lot of them, so please bear with me and please, uh, guys, try to keep your questions on topic and short. Um, the first question that I see just off the top of my, my screen is from Sena from Denmark, who's asking, what does it mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shy, Sheikh Omar? Jazakumullah uh, khair. So the, the, the idea of Allah being shy, the Prophet Sallallahu explained it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too shy that when a servant of his calls out to him, uh, with his hands extended, supplicating to him alone, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would allow those hands to be turned down empty and rejected. So Allah in his generosity, Allah in his grace, Allah in his mercy, Allah in his love, when someone calls out to him and says, Ya Rabb, sincerely, oh my Lord, sincerely, uh, think about, and walillah al al-a'la, to Allah belongs the highest uh, of examples. Think about the most generous person you've ever met. Right, like someone that you knew, if you asked them anything, they were going to oblige somehow. <clears throat> right, small or big, just the point is, is like, think about the most generous, open hearted person you ever met, and think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and His mercy, you know, 99 parts of which we've never even been exposed to, and His his attributes and His limitless uh, mercy and and uh, and love and generosity. And that's why we say, Allah minna ka'afu and tuhibbu al-afwa. Right? Oh Allah, you love to forgive because Allah is so shy. When you, when you talk to someone, subhanAllah, and you say to them, that you, you, you mentioned their good characteristics to them. I know you're always there for me. And I just thought, then that's why I knew I could reach out to you. If you're that person on the receiving end, this is a human being, right? With a limited capacity. And your friend called you and said, you know, you're always there for me, Jazakallah khair. So I, I decided to call you because at that point, let me listen attentively because I like, I need to live up to the what, what my friend just called upon me with, calling upon Allah, all right? And Allah, Rabbaka yuhibbul hamd, Allah loves praise. And you're praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're mentioning these names and attributes. Allah is too shy to let your hands fall without an answer. Beautiful. Jazakallah khair. I'm seeing a few lengthy ones. I'll try to get through his, them as quickly as I can. Uh, Layla from Georgia is asking, 
I've heard that there are different, different rankings given to the messengers of Allah and Prophet has the highest ranking. If that is true, why is Isa salam not at the same ranking as Prophet Muhammad salam, especially when Isa salam had many miracles and was given the duty to come back to earth and defeat the Dajjal? Why wasn't Muhammad salam given the duty if his ranking was higher than all the other prophets? So first of all, in terms of miracles in terms of duties there's no difference between the messengers of allah none of them there's no distinction all of the messengers of allah were sent with the purpose of establishing tawheed with the establishment with the establishment of risala um, so the monotheism and the message of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever law they either were given a new or renewing uh, of a prophet or a messenger that came before them so they're all the same in that sense all right. No prophet is a malak, is an angel. All right. They're all the same in that sense. Now, there are rankings amongst the prophets in terms of fadl, in terms of virtue. And that's why we have ulul azmi min al rusul, the five most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are, of course, Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet وسلم, is the most beloved of Allah's creation to him, period. He's more beloved to Allah than all of the prophets and messengers. He's more beloved to Allah than Jibreel السلام, and the angels. He's more beloved to Allah than the world and all that exists within it. He is the most beloved of Allah's creation to him. He is a rahmah to al alamin, the universal prophet, a, a man وسلم, whose message lives on, whose example lives on and is the last and final prophet, the seal of the prophets, the one who was the imam of the prophets. The prophets prayed behind our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa on the night of al-Isra' al-Mi'raj, including Isa Islam. After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the ulama differ from ulul azmi min al-Rusul. Can we assign any type of rankings? Some of them say it's Ibrahim alayhi salam, who Abu al-Anbiya, he's the father of the prophet. Some say Isa alayhi salam, uh, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa praised him in so many different ways. So the ranking at that point, in terms of virtue and love, Allah knows best. Most of the scholars say Ibrahim Islam. And the Prophet Islam, by the way, did not like these discussions. He didn't like, he said, don't say uh, I'm better than Ibrahim. Don't say I'm better than you. Don't do this comparison between prophets in that sense, right? So even indulging the conversation, because then you might unknowingly take away from the maqam of another prophet when extolling your Prophet Islam. And you don't need to take away from the virtue of another prophet to extol the virtue of your prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So like a, a Muslim man and a Jewish man got an argument in Medina. And what was the argument? Um, the Jewish man said, Musa alayhi salam, bi rabbi Musa, by the Lord of Musa. The Muslim man said, bi rabbi Muhammad, by the Lord of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then they started, to, they had an argument um, you know, where the Muslim man said, Muhammad وسلم, is better than Musa. وسلم. And the Jewish man responded to the opposite. So what did the Muslim man do? He punched the Jewish man. The Jewish man came to the Prophet وسلم, complaining. What did the Prophet وسلم, say? He did not say, well, he kind of had a point. <laughs> he didn't say that. The Prophet وسلم, extolled Musa وسلم, and said, on the day of judgment, when I am resurrected, and I make my way to the throne, I would see that Musa Islam is already hanging on to one of the legs of the throne. And I don't know if perhaps that is because he was spared from a sa'iqa, spared from the, the shock, the shout, because of what occurred with him at a tour. So uh, the Prophet Islam took that as an opportunity to praise Musa Islam. Okay. Uh, so this is really powerful, really beautiful. The adab that the Prophet Sallallahu had with the other Prophets and the adab that we have with the Prophet Sallallahu and the adab we have with all the other Prophets. As for his miracles, the miracles of Isa Islam are not unique to him from Bani Israel. There are Prophets, like the Prophet Elijah is mentioned as raising 700 people from the dead. There are Prophets that raise the dead. There are Prophets that performed healing. There are Prophets that did the miracles of Isa Islam. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Isa alayhi salam because he was the greatest and the final prophet of Bani Israel. He gave him the, a, a, a version of the miracles of all of those prophets. Okay. Um, and what he did, alayhi salatu salam. Now, why did Allah choose him? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose him and not Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, particularly for returning to establish 
uh, justice on earth. That is Allah's anointing of Isa as Al Masih. That's a particular distinction to him. However, when Isa Islam comes down as Al Masih, know that he is coming down as a Muslim and a follower of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He will pray behind a man from this Ummah, Al Mahdi. And when he descends, subhanAllah, the, the image of it in Asham, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help the people of Asham and assist them against their oppressors. Uh, the Salah would have, the Iqamah would have been made already. And Mahdi is about to lead the Salah. And Isa Islam descends at that moment on the wings of two angels. <laughs> he comes down on the wings of two angels and the Muslims know it's him. There is no like, what are we seeing? No, it's him. And he comes forward. And the Prophet ﷺ said that Mahdi would take a step back because Isa Islam is greater than him, right? And Isa Islam would say, stay and lead the Salah because the Iqamah was made for you. And the Prophet ﷺ said, what an honor for your Ummah when Isa Islam prays behind a man from your Ummah. And that will be a means of validation that I'm here this time as a follower of Muhammad ﷺ and his Sharia is the one that is in effect and I will uphold his Sharia. And Isa Islam will become the Imam where? This is amazing. He'll be the Imam in Medina. Isa alayhi salam will assume at that point being the Imam in Al-Medina. We know that through various things because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned he saw him uh, traveling to do Hajj, doing Hajj, coming from the Miqat, from the direction of Medina, saying, Labayk Allahumma Labayk, the same way that the Prophet ﷺ came. So Isa alayhi salam comes back as a follower of Muhammad ﷺ doing the ritual of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So it's the prophets are all converging around the same message of Tawheed. It centralizes at that point. And Isa alayhi salam will be buried uh, next to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So imagine subhanAllah going to Masjid al-Nabawi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is buried there and Isa alayhi salam is the Imam. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and, and, and truly, you know, those that are the followers of the Prophet ﷺ are honored in various ways, and Allah will honor th that 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 group of the Ummah would have been through some very difficult times. <laughs> they would have been through a Dajjal, right? They would have been through some very difficult years. And so Allah is blessing them with the most beautiful years that they could have. Isa as is their Imam in Al Madinah. There is no injustice on earth at that point. There is no shirk on earth, there's no persecution. Those are the best years. For the believers, but they come after some of the hardest years on earth, and that's the the mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in that regard. Uh, Jazakallah khair to whoever asked that question. We got like a bonus talk right at the end there. Alhamdulillah as well. Um, I'm going to sneak in one more question, inshallah, and, and we'll close off at that, um, Sheikh Omar. Uh, the last question that I see, and I'm sorry, I know there's like 50 plus, Sheikh, everyone's private messaging me. I promise I'm not making this up. <laughs> there's like 50 plus that are just scrolling, 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 alhamdulillah. The next question I see is from Zainab from Singapore, who's asking, uh, why did Zakaria al-Islam ask Allah, how is it possible for me to have a child after just supplicating to him for one? It always puzzles me. Did he not, did he need some kind of insur, uh, assurance or did he not feel confident? What was the reason why? I'm so glad you asked that question, subhanAllah, because uh, and, and it's a good question to end on. Um, Zakaria alayhi salam was not questioning Allah's ability. Zakaria alayhi salam was saying, Anna yakunu li ghulam, as in like, what is this? He's asking about the mechanics of this, the means of this happening at this point. So wait, how is it going to happen? Not how can, like you can't do it or questioning whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do it or not. So it's he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the means by which this is going to happen. Okay. And in that situation, by the way, Yahya alayhi salam was already, um, uh, you know, uh, there in the womb of, of his wife. So Yahya, one of the meanings of Yahya gave life to a womb that otherwise did not produce life. So he went home and his wife was already pregnant. So he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the means, the mechanics, the way that this is going to happen. And of course, there's a, a means of shock and joy and all of it mixed together. But he's not questioning Allah's ability. He's asking how it's going to happen. Uh, this is similar, by the way, we were talking about it in, in the Quran 30 for 30. Sheikh Abdullah was, was clarifying, uh, you know, when Allah mentions that Yunus as he, was, as he was walking away, he thought that Allah would not overcome him. It's not that he didn't think Allah could overcome him. He thought that, you know, I did my job at this point. I'm walking away uh, after having delivered the message. And he didn't think Allah would punish him. Not that he didn't think Allah could punish him. Okay. 
And so sometimes those, those subtleties are lost. And so Zakaria Islam knows the, the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He just saw it with Maryam alayhi salam that, that Allah produces out of nothing risk um, and so uh, sustenance. So he believed it fully. Jazakumullah khair for that answer, Sheikh Omar. Um, inshallah, we'll close off there. I know I'm going to get like hate messages I'm <laughs> still. Sorry. It's but my gonna... fault. I talked, I spoke too long. So I apologize. No, it wasn't for the question. length. It's for the fact that I didn't give you more time, Sheikh. I've got so many people requesting. Just let him keep going. Don't stop him. Don't stop him. But alhamdulillah for this blessing of a session. Jazakumullah khair for giving us that extra bit of time, actually, and okay. for honoring our questions as well. May Allah reward you immensely for your efforts. Um, inshallah, I'll have a couple of quick reminders, but we do look forward to seeing you again tomorrow, Sheikh Omar, for our Shukr webinar happening at 2 p.m. EST. So I dropped the link as well for you all to register to get another reminder and to catch the Sheikh uh, on another platform. But Jazakumullah for everything that you're doing for the community. May Allah allow you to end your Ramadan strong. I can, for efforts. Yes, I can just ask everyone to please keep me and my family in your du'a in these last 10 nights. Um, yes. Please keep my parents in your du'a, my family in your du'a, inshallah. I'd really appreciate it. Jazakumullah. Absolutely, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair once again, Sheikh Farah. Take care for, for now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Alrighty, everyone who enjoyed that session, I hope that you guys love that visualization and your imagination was running wild just as it was, as it was for me. Um, it actually reminded me so much of a talk and actually uh, an entire class that Sheikh Amr has done for a uh for Faith Essentials, actually. A lot of you who have registered already for Faith Essentials or for the All Access Pass or are registering in the future have access to this already. But this beautiful, beautiful course um, uh, that I've seen before through the fire uh, this the journey of Salman al Farsi. It was taught in that same kind of exciting uh, tone, that that same storytelling vibe. So if you benefited from this one as well, the story of Ayub al Islam, those are my favorite kind of interactions. That storytelling style that Sheikh Hamid Sinaman has is absolutely beautiful. So I encourage you guys to take full advantage of it, especially if you're looking for some inspiration in your ibadah in the last ten nights. And I want to take a moment to remind you all, Subhanallah. I know Sheikh Omar knows this more than anybody. Uh, but as, as much as there is, you know, fitna and there's things that you have to control yourself and, and, you know, things that you have to distance yourself from on the internet, one of the biggest blessings that you have, uh, and that we have as an institution as well is that, uh, especially since the pandemic has started, because we've been able to provide a lot of these online, uh, options, all, all these online courses, virtual classes that are live online classes that are recorded. Sheikh Omar has three of them, mashallah, through Online. Um, and so many other forms of, you know, webinars and, and Ramadan through 60 and all these sessions, it adds a, a lot of barakah to the community and it adds a lot of sadaqa jariya without us having to uh, even do something additional. Alhamdulillah, when you provide something online, there is so much extra ajr that becomes possible. Like sometimes I see, I see you know, a few hundred people in, in our sessions here who, who make the time to come in live. And then I'll see thousands and thousands and thousands of people benefiting from the recordings. Uh, mashallah. I want to encourage you guys while you are here and while you guys are trying to multiply your deeds and take the most of your last 10 nights to make sure that you also keep uh, the your Islamic institutions and especially as well uh, a maghrib inshallah in your da'as and as well support them financially. So everything that we are able to do online, you guys have a share in the reward for that as well. It becomes a source of sadiq ajariya for you guys. I, subhanAllah, over the last 10 nights and over the entire all of Ramadan and throughout the years, I'm always making the offer those who, when I was a younger student uh, and I was taking advantage of Amal scholarships, uh, which is one of the things, the first option that you see on amalgrib.org slash support is our scholarships. And you'll see that linked in your description as well if you're coming in from YouTube and Facebook. Um, but I'm constantly making the offer those people who donated and it allowed me to take scholarships and attend my first few classes and actually you know, be, be able to benefit to the point that I uh, you know, attended regularly and became a volunteer and then became part of the staff and I see the hundreds of thousands of people who benefiting, who are benefiting year after year after year. Um, well over 150,000, nearly 200,000 regular students and unique students that we've had. And then subhanAllah, all the people who've seen things for free and caught things on YouTube and on Facebook and in so many different ways. So I encourage you guys, and you don't know how many the eyes you're getting out of the process. You don't know how many people you're getting guided. I've shared the story before that someone who had messaged, uh, who had asked a question to one of our instructors during our Ramadan 360 session, been able to do that way to a friend. And in the month of Ramadan, just a few days ago, was able to have that friend convert to Islam. So subhanAllah, even just a, a video here and there, the amount of like positive feedback that we get and people converting and people coming to the deen or people, you know, be, being rescued from, from being distant from the deen or family members or fitna that's being erased from the community. Alhamdulillah, there's so much good that you're a part of when you are supporting something like this. So I encourage you guys, especially while you're trying to capitalize and multiply and do whatever you can 
to make the most of your last 10 nights that you have of Ramadan, make sure that you make a mugger uh, part of that process as well. And of course, continue that journey. Don't stop now. Make sure that the classes that you see, you see Sheikh Hamar Zaliman has classes on faith essentials, register for them. If you have uh, you know, time to attend live classes, make sure that you attend Sheikh Saad Taslim's uh, Quranic Lives class coming up. Don't let the journey stop now. That would be the biggest way to, 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 to become, you know, to, to lose out after this, this uh, you know, month ends. You guys are consistently coming in every single day, taking a class, engaging, benefiting. Um, make sure that you continue that, inshallah. And Farisa has dropped that in the chat for those who, who uh, want to check out amalgrip.org slash vibes is the registration for Quranic vibes. And if you want to kind of win the golden ticket to everything and you want to be, uh, you want to kind of steal a show, inshallah, then I register for the all access pass. That's one of the options for the amalgrip.org uh, slash support. That's one of the options that you can purchase is get access to everything. So all of the online classes uh, that we're launching in the year, all of the live virtual classes that we have and everything on Faith Essentials. That's like 70 something classes in total. Obviously you can kind of control and you have lifetime access to certain things. So you'll have time to go through them, but that allows you to make this next year, inshallah, your, your year of ilm, inshallah ta'ala. Um, now next, I don't want to take too much more time. I know we got a little long with that session, but I don't think anybody minded alhamdulillah about that. Um, uh, so inshallah, let's jump right into one of our final because we have Shay Saad Taslim here today. We have two guest instructors the next couple of days, and then we have just a few more days left of Quranic Vibes. Sorry, Quranic Reflection Circles. Quranic Vibes is afterwards, inshallah. Uh, one of our final Quranic Reflection Circles on the topic uh, or on the, on the title for Juz number 26, inshallah. Shay Saad has dropped that link into the chat. It's Surah Al-Hujurat, verse number 12. Shaykh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How, how are you doing today? Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm doing well. Alhamdulillah. It's good to be here. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Shaykh, are you feeling the, the feels? Are you feeling the, the goodbye? I'm already time? feeling the yeah. feels. I got the feels. It's just, it's so weird, subhanAllah. Um, you know, we have a little, I'm sure a lot of you have a little countdown for the end of Ramadan. You know, how many days have passed? And like every star that we put on that chart, it's like, ah, oh, it's like heartbreak, subhanAllah. Um, and for me also, it's like the, you know, the reflection circles. Uh, yeah. Just counting down, you know, we have a schedule for the days. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to miss these. I'm going to miss these. Hopefully we can continue this vibe. Uh -huh. I will continue this vibe in the Quranic vibe seminar, inshallah. Data. So I'm looking forward to teaching that. I know, I know we have that, you know, cause that, um, it's, uh, it's just this, but you know, a little bit more intense. So, so I'm looking forward to that. Inshallah. I've got plenty of places. Uh, plenty of locations to teach we know we got the east coast uh here in the u.s um teaching across the world i don't even remember all the dates but you know inshallah we're going to be able to do this inshallah actually the, the the first class is really soon after ramadan it's i think three weeks yeah. after ramadan june 5th to 6th with the east coast yeah. so those who are going to start feeling you know preemptively if you want to protect yourself from the loss of of, of the quranic reflection circles i recommend inshallah registering for that to continue the journey you know Sheikh, they say like it takes 21 days to build a habit now we're in this habit of reflecting so we're going to need your advice on how to kind of you know get out of the month and continue to do this until we have our sure, our little book sure. boost with i was planning on speaking speaking on that you know in the last day inshallah inshallah um, allow us to reach that day uh, but kind of how to keep continuing uh, with reflecting upon the Quran inshallah beautiful all right so it's a hijrat verse 12 inshallah let's jump into our reflections bismillah shaykh <clears throat> bismillah uh, bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala allahumma la ilma lana illa ma allamtana innaka anta al alim al hakim allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilma ya rabbal alameen اللهم أرنا الحق حق ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطل ورزقنا اجتنابه اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Good to be back Alhamdulillah uh, Today we are in juz number 26 uh, Approaching the end of the Quran uh, Juz number 26 uh, We have quite a few surahs in this juz we have Surah Al-Ahqaf, uh, all of it, Surah Muhammad, all of it, Surah Al-Fatih, uh, all of it, Al-Hujurat, which we, we're going to reflect upon a verse from it today, uh, all of Al-Hujurat, all of Surah Qaf, and Al-Dhariyat um, until verse number 30, inshallah ta'ala. So today's verse is Surah Al-Hujurat, verse number 12. Uh, once again, there, there were so many amazing verses uh, to pick from. Uh, but this is uh, a verse that I personally connect with and I found a lot of benefit over the years. And there's just a lot of, to extract out of this verse. 
Um, and, you know, a lot of these issues that are mentioned, actually in Surah Al-Hujrat as a whole, a lot of these issues are issues that continue to be issues. And so we all need reminders uh, regarding these issues and particularly what we're going to discuss today, uh, inshallah. So if we could have um, someone recite for us, inshallah, the Arabic portion of this verse or the Arabic of this verse. Alrighty, let's see. Um, my memory is, is very, very bad. So I think everyone so far, I think has read before. Sheikh, I might need a little bit of help. I want to see if I can get a new name, but I think everyone, mashallah, has read before, correct? Uh, okay. Uh, I don't think Sister Gina has read. And I know she's been attending the Quran Revolution, right? Yes. So oh. so that's that's awesome. So let's let's get her to, to recite, inshallah. Yeah, that'll be good. Sounds like a plan, inshallah. Awesome. So I that you're welcome to share, uh, to read this minute. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Yes, I'm a level two. So yes, Alhamdulillah. I will, Alhamdulillah. I will do my best. Alhamdulillah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu shtanibu qadhiram minna ghananna inna ta'adda Master <laughs> Jazakallah khair, ahsanti, that was, that was awesome, subhanAllah. You know, it reminds me, every time I hear, you know, people recite um, and learning how to recite and, you know, really getting into it, it reminds me of my days, um, actually, before I went to Medina, uh, I, I took a, a summer during college and I went to Egypt uh, and I studied in Cairo for about three months. It was a whole summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, one of the things I, well, I studied Arabic there and also Quran. And, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes uh, like the Egyptians are known to be very strict when it comes to the Quran. So I would have uh, subhanAllah, my Quran teacher uh, he was very, very strict on me, like very strict. Um, but, you know, I was new in my faith and I was just so like motivated. Um, and even though it was difficult and now I look back at that and I'm like very grateful to, you know, how tough he was on me. Uh, one of the things that, that I always remember about that, that time in my life is, um, you know, I was a student, uh, you know, I was in college, didn't have a lot of money. I had a very limited budget uh, for how much money I could go. You know, I needed to pay uh, you know, the, the tutors in Egypt to, to study Arabic and, you know, um, rent and food. Uh, most of the time, I don't know if we have any Egyptian in, in, the, in the house, but I just ended up eating kushari every day because it's like, you know, very cheap, uh, just street food. Um, but I didn't, we didn't, um, I remember I went with a friend, we didn't um, factor in Quran, right? So we we're like, oh, we're going to go study Arabic. But I was there and there were so many great teachers uh, to teach us, you know, Tajweed and Quran, recitation of the Quran. Um, so I was like, how do I fit it in? And so, uh, you know, one of my um, Arabic teachers, uh, he said, you know, there's a brother here who can teach you Quran. You know, he's, he's, a, he's proficient in Quran. He's well known. I said, okay, so I, don't, I, don't have any, I don't have any money to pay him. Like I'm budgeted out. I got nothing. And he goes, uh, okay, let me, let me speak to him. Let me see, let me see what we can do. And then, you know, the brother came and we, we talked to him and, and he said, look, uh, I heard you bought a fan uh, for, for your apartment, you know, for the summer. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, what are you going to do with it when you leave? And I was like, I don't know. He goes, okay, just give me the fan and that's your, that's your payment. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah. And it was, it was like a decent fan, but it was like this amazing fan. It was like one of those, you know, fans that, you know, uh, what is it called? Smooth or whatever. Um, and it was hot, didn't have any AC. Uh, but he's like, yeah, just give me the fan. And he, like, he was not well off, you know? So he's like, give me the fan. You know, I need a fan and I'll teach you. And I was like, and I, part of that was like, I felt incredibly indebted to him. And I wanted to try really, really hard. Cause I'm like, this guy's teaching me just for a fan. Sister Jeannie, you, you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say one thing. I actually reverted to Islam, like I said, probably before like a year and a half ago. 
about. And so I've been studying uh, the Quran for less than a year, like about 11 months. I started with Quran Revolution like Shalom. last year. So Alhamdulillah, I know I still have a lot of work to do. No, you did well. You did well. Alhamdulillah. 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 You did better than me when I started reciting the Quran. <laughs> I, I struggled, I struggled quite a bit with the Quran, alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you and increase you in goodness and, and reward you. Allahumma ameen. Okay, uh, jazakallah khair. So let's, let's start, inshallah. So Surah Al-Hujurat, verse number 12, as our dear sister recited, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ijtanibu kathiram min al uh, O believers, avoid making a lot of uh, suspicions. Let me put this in the chat once again. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O believers, avoid making a lot of assumptions. Uh, itham, for certainly, uh, some of these uh, assumptions are sins, or we can say some of these assumptions are sinful. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا, uh, وَلَا وَلَا That do not um, spy on one another and do not backbite one another. أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتَهِ that would any of you like to eat the dead flesh of their brother? Uh, certainly you would despise that. You would hate that. That would be something very hated to you. And have the taqwa of Allah. Be conscious of Allah. Inna tawwabur rahim. Certainly Allah is the acceptor of repentance. Allah accepts repentance and the most or most merciful. Now let's break this down, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, the very beginning, Allah says, Ya amanu ijtanibu min uh, As always, when Allah says, Ya amanu, O believers, as Ibn Umar radiallahu an would say, that our ears should perk up. Meaning that Allah is directly speaking to us. Like as a believer, we identify as a believer. This is a statement Allah is calling out to us. So I know a lot of times we, we you know, in the Quran, we hear like these instructions and these morals and, and we, we start looking at other people, right? We're like, okay, you know, that person does this and, you know, they fall under this eye and that person does this and this and this, and we forget to look at ourselves. Or sometimes it's easier to criticize other people than criticize oneself. And so the first thing we should do is we should make this personal, right? And that's, as you know, part of reflecting the Quran, we've been working on this, making every verse personal. Like how does it fit into my life? So once again, this is, this is should be a trigger for us for us to for us to really think okay where do, like what is uh, like what is Allah saying to me now if Allah is directly now speaking to me okay I better listen up so Allah says yeah you ladina amanu o believers ijtanibu kathiran min al that avoid making a lot of uh, suspicions or uh, or um, uh, avoid uh, that that uh, that doubtful thinking um, uh, being suspicious of other people. Uh, that uh, some of the assumptions are sinful or uh, some of that will be sins. Now, uh, Allah mentions this here. It's very interesting because when we suspect someone of something, uh, we often feel powerful, right? We often feel like we, all, we often feel like we're in a position of power because we're now looking down upon someone, right? And that's why sometimes, uh, you know, uh, cops and authority uh, you know, they, they feel good when they're in a position of power because they get to investigate other people. And sometimes people can, as we know, you know, we have this problem in America, but people can get power hungry and they can abuse that power and so on and so forth. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting the one who is making this suspicion, the, uh, Allah is putting them in a position where they have to watch out for themselves, right? That no, you're not in a, power, a position of power, rather you're in a position where you are susceptible where you could be the, you know, the quote, unquote victim here, or you could be, you could be the casualty in what, what is happening here. You could be, or you are the one who could very, very well be in, in, in wrong. And you could, you could, um, you're the one who could suffer by going through this process. So instead of, and once again, instead of feeling like a person is in a position of power and they can now look down upon other people, once again, it is to look inward. And once again, with what we said, Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, O believers, right? So once again, making it personal, looking at ourselves and not looking at the others. Because when we start making assumptions, when we start uh, su uh, suspecting other people, it's really easy to focus on that person, right? Well, I'm just, I'm just finding the truth. I'm just trying to expose the truth. I just, I just want to know what happened. That person is at fault. And here Allah is saying, no, there's a very good chance that simply by suspecting someone, or making assumptions about someone, you are at fault here. And this is what Allah said, that that some of that suspicion 
uh, is sin or is, is sinfulness. And also some scholars mention here that um, this also means that if we keep making assumptions, if we keep going down that path of suspecting others, that sooner or later we will fall into sin. Maybe at some point we were, we were not sinful, but sooner or later we go down that path and we would adopt that uh, as our way to, to suspect others all the time. Well, sooner or later we are going to fall into sin. Uh, we have the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, He said, He said, beware of suspicion or assumptions. Uh, for certainly uh, suspicion or assumptions is the worst of false speech, is the, is the worst type of speech. And so now communicating that suspicion to others, um, and what we're going to talk about how, you know, if it only stopped at suspicion, we might be able to get away. Maybe, maybe we might be able to get away with it. But in the vast majority of cases, it doesn't stop at assumptions. It doesn't stop at suspicions. There is a path that a person goes down, uh, which is one of the reflections upon this verse, as when we look at it as a whole, we see a process that, that occurs or a path that a person goes down, which begins with suspicion, which begins with making uh, assumptions. And what we're talking about here is actually su'adhan, right? Su'adhan is uh, assuming the worst, right? Assuming the worst or thinking the worst in other people, and which is the opposite of husnadhan. And husnadhan is thinking or assuming the best. Husnadhan is a positive thing. We see something happen, uh, we come across something, we say to ourselves, okay, what is a good explanation for this? What is a positive assumption for this? Um, rather than the su'adhan uh, would be, well, what exactly, you know, we start thinking bad of this person. Those of you who took deception, we spoke about this as one of the methods of deception of the shaytan, that shaytan uses su'adhan. He uses um, um, assuming the worst in other people as a way to get us to dis disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And certainly in this verse, we see here that Allah is saying that, from that suspicion or amongst that suspicion or that assumptions, a person will fall into sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, protect us. Um, if you've ever dealt, if you've ever been in a position where you have to uh, help people who are in conflict or you've had to do some conflict resolution, uh, one of the quickest and simplest ways to resolve conflict is for one or both parties to give the other party the benefit of the doubt, all right? is to assume the best, assume good, conflict immediately dies. Uh, one of the quickest ways, on the other hand, to uh, exacerbate that conflict, to inflame the conflict, is for one or both parties to assume the worst. Right? That immediately makes it where um, the conflict, it just, it, it cannot, it gets worse, and it's very hard to cut out that conflict because our mind begins to run wild. And even if a person comes and says, you know, no, there's an explanation for this, there's an explanation for that. Well, when, you, when we let our minds go wild, right? When we let our, let our thoughts go wild, there's no end to that. And we can keep coming up with more and more and more and more negative uh, or bad assumptions uh, about an, an individual. Um, in my uh, deception class, I, I usually give the example just to kind of like drive this point home um, of, you know, of, uh, of, of a situation where you think that there is no uh, good assumption, right? And, and for us, the cure to that is we remind ourselves that even though I can't think of a good assumption uh, or a good explanation, it doesn't mean that a good explanation doesn't exist. And sometimes our, our mind and heart is just so clouded uh, with negative thoughts that we, we don't allow ourselves to think of a positive assumption. So this is why sometimes you'll hear people say like, oh, th there's no, there's no positive, like there's no good uh, assumption here, right? There's no positive way to, to look at this. Like this person, you know, this person said this and they definitely meant this, right? And they definitely, and they did it for this reason. Um, a, a, a good example that, that I like to give is, uh, especially, you know, in, in, in nowadays when it comes to being online, uh, and reading, even reading what people have said, and, and we think to ourselves, you know, like it literally says this, like obviously they meant this. Uh, it's written right in front of me. But the reality is even when things are written, there's so much that is missing. Uh, context is missing. The tone is, is missing. Even emphasis on certain words can completely change the meaning of what the person meant. Uh, and the example that I usually like to give is uh, something that may be known to some of you, but the statement... Um, I never said she stole your money. I'm going to type this in the, in the chat so you can follow along with me. 
Okay, so this statement, I typed it, right? Y'all can read this, right? And we, yeah, we mentioned this in Quranic vibes as well. Right? I usually men mention the example because it's a powerful example. I never said she stole your money, okay? How many words? How many words are these? Seven. I never said she stole your money. Seven words. Seven words, and now do it with me. Let's emphasize one word at a time in the statement, right? So let's do the first one. I never said she stole your money. What does this mean? Well, this means I never said it. Maybe somebody else said it, right? That's one meaning, okay? And then let's emphasize the second word. I never said she stole your money. Meaning this is just never, never happened, right? And, and this can never come from me. I never said that she stole your money. I never said she stole your money, okay? Now, what does that mean? Well, I didn't say it. I possibly Im implied it. I maybe gestured towards that, you know, but I never said it, right? I never said she stole your money, okay? I never said she stole your money. Or I never, sorry, yeah, I never said she stole your money. Maybe somebody else did. Maybe I did. Maybe, you know, but her, no, not her. I never said she stole your money, okay? I never said she stole your money. She might have borrowed it right? She might have gotten possession of it in some way, but I never said she stole your money, okay? I never said she stole your money, meaning what? She might have stolen somebody else's money, but she didn't steal your money. I never said she stole your money. She might have you know, stolen your car, your whatever else, your clothes, but she never stole your money. Now, imagine, subhanAllah, this one statement, and you can do this with so many different statements. This one statement, seven different meanings. Now you tell me, how fair is it to make a judgment about someone based off of something that they typed online? When you don't, you can't hear their tone, you can't hear their voice, you can't talk to them. There, there's no context there. You just like we read something, we make an assumption. She definitely meant this. He definitely meant that. What is she trying to say? You know what is going on? And that is all of that occurs, subhanAllah, in, in our heart, in our mind, where we are, subhanAllah, where we're thinking about all this stuff and we're applying our own bias to what we're reading. And I, I've experienced this so very many times. Um, subhanAllah, when I post something online, you know, Facebook, or usually it's a tweet and then I, you know, post it on Instagram as well. Um, it's very interesting to me how people perceive what I have posted. And a lot of times, it's, you know, I, I have to like stop myself from like psychoanalyzing the person who is responding to what I said, because like so much of their their life and their background, what they've been through, like comes into play in, in terms of how they perceived what I've written. And I always find it very interesting that, you know, and I've had this discussion, this discussion with uh, Sheikh Kamal, who's a very good friend of mine, Sheikh Kamal Makki. He's one of those like anti social media type of people, right? I don't know if you follow him online, but he'll, he's online in bursts. Like he'll come on and like for a month, he'll go crazy, like just posting, posting, posting. And then he's gone for like two years, like never post anything. I don't know if you log on to his Twitter right now when the last time he posted something, Allah lot him. But he's one of those people. But so I've had this conversation with him where he's like, you know, we we're talking about how you can post the most, like the nicest, most feel good statement in the world, right? Something which is very politically correct, like the least offensive thing in the world. And there's going to be somebody who's like, I disagree, right? You know what? You're wrong, right? The person who finds an exception in everything that you say, right? You know what? In my experience, this and that, like even something smiling is charity. Well, you know what? Sometimes smiling is not charity because sometimes you're smiling and you know what? You're actually belittling the person. And you know, you smile in a condescending way, and da 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 da. And I got it's like, whoa, calm down, man. This was supposed to be one of those posts that you read it and you said, Alhamdulillah, and you go and you smile at somebody. But once again, that those thoughts that go through our mind and our personal bias, right? Like what we have been through. So obviously for me, the personal lesson for that is obviously to be careful when we are communicating. Uh, that we are aware and also not to like jump on people because you know there are times where i just want to get in the get in the comments and be like what are you talking about like that is not what i meant like how could you assume that like let me tell you why you made this assumption here's my psychoanalysis of your problems in your life but obviously that's not going to solve anything and, and and that's why my policy online those of you who follow me online is to never reply like i don't i don't get into arguments and discussions online like it just doesn't happen because for me it, it goes back comes back to this 
it is very difficult to communicate with someone online. It is very difficult because there's so much that can be read into what is being said. And so, you know, we're talking about conflict resolution, right? So I'm always like, look, if you want to resolve a conflict, like don't reply online. Don't even send someone like, oh, I'll send them a private message. Don't send them a private message. I'll send them a text message. No, don't send them a text message. Don't WhatsApp them. If you can, go speak to them in person. And if you really can't do that, then give them a call and have a call. That's, that's not as good as talking to them in person because when you're face-to-face -face with someone, you're talking to someone, they become, you humanize them, right? And your, your, uh, uh, your ability to, to empathize goes up. And empathy is actually a big part of avoiding bad assumptions, right? And, and this is one of the things that I was reflecting upon when it comes to this verse here is that if we were to empathize with people more, we would be less likely to, to assume the worst in them. Because we ourselves, we always want people to give us the benefit of the doubt, right? Nobody, nobody's cool with being on the receiving end with bad assumptions, right? When it's like, you know, we're actually, we get very offended sometimes when someone's like, where someone makes an assumption, we're like, how dare you assume, like, don't you know me? Like, why would you assume that about me? And so on and so forth. Well, well, how come we don't offer that same courtesy to the people on the other end, right? So if we can empathize with the person, part of empathy is humanizing the person, right? Then, then can we, then, you know, we can perhaps, perhaps uh, fight this issue of assuming uh, bad in, in people. Uh, so that's in a nutshell, some of the reflections regarding su uh, of or bad assumptions. And then Allah says, uh, and do not spy. Right. Do not go and investigate people. And this is like the next step. So when when someone starts with uh, bad assumptions, then the next step is to, let me go confirm my assumptions. Right. Someone will, someone may come to us and say, well, you know, you, that's just conjecture. Like that's like you're just assuming that like you don't know if that's the case. And then the person thinks or the shaitan comes and says, yeah, you know, they're right. You know what you can do now? You can go investigate it. You know, go follow this person, go check it out, go, go, go creep on their social media, right? And find out what else they're up to. And can you confirm? Because now somebody said, oh, you're just making assumptions. You're not supposed to make bad assumptions. And now you got to defend yourself. So now the person says, okay, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that what I assumed is correct. And how do I do that? By spying on this person. So now getting into their business, going, looking through their, you know, their online posts or whatever, oh, maybe it's all serving now the initial problem of that bad assumption. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, do not, do not spy, uh, do not spy on people. Uh, we have many uh, narrations regarding this uh, as well, um, where, uh, for example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in Sunan Abi Dawood, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, that if you were to seek out the faults of the, of the Muslims, you will corrupt them or you will ruin them. In another narration of the same hadith, the Prophet وسلم, he said, that if you were to uh, constantly, and this is uh, the Prophet وسلم, is describing constantly seeking the faults uh, of people. Uh, and in this narration, an nas, right? So not Muslims, but an nas, people all together, upset the home, you would ruin them. Now, what is the Prophet, Prophet ﷺ describing here? He's describing um, one of the uh, understandings of this hadith is that if you're always focusing and looking for people's faults and flaws, you will ruin this person, right? Because you will get you, this is all you will see about them. This is all you will focus on them. You will define them as a bad person. And soon, sooner or later, you may turn the community and people against them and this person will be ruined. And eventually it will have an effect on the community as a whole, right? And, 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 and so this is the danger here that this, this, this ruins uh, our communities. The reality is we all have faults and we all have flaws. And yes, obviously if someone is doing something wrong and it's public and so on and so forth, we stand up for that which is right. And, and you know we wanna discourage evil and bad. But this is a case where a person really goes out of their way and just to, just to find some fault uh, in, in the other person. And so, uh, um, uh, 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 so, uh, so then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we said, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا Do not uh, spy or investigate. وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْدُكُمْ بَعْضَ And do not backbite one another. Uh, Nah. Uh, so, uh, nah. so do not backbite one another. Now, backbiting is a topic which, subhanAllah, once again, this is one of the topics you could spend uh, a lot of time on. 
Um, but I want to mention some of this briefly. We've spoken about backbiting before. Uh, as the Prophet Sallallahu described it or defined it himself, backbiting is simply to say something about your brother uh, that they wouldn't like, you know, regardless of it being true or not. In, in, in actuality, if we know that what we're saying is false, it becomes slander, right? Uh, when we say something false about somebody. So this is the case where if we're saying something which is true to backbite someone, um, you know, this is, this is something... Uh, this is backbiting, and backbiting we know in Islam is a uh, major, major sin. Um, now, backbiting involves mentioning other people, right? Talking about other people. And if we're following along that this same process or the or the the road that this person went down, they started with bad assumptions. Then they went to investigate those assumptions, right? They went, they, they suspected something when they investigated. Now that they've investigated, now they're going to start talking about it to other people, right? So this is that really dangerous path that one can go down uh, when it all starts with those bad assumptions or suspicions regarding uh, other people. Uh, a very beautiful statement by Umar radiallahu an. He said, "Iyakum wa dhikr nas fa innahu da, wa alaykum bi dhikrillah fa innahu shafa." He said, uh, "Beware of mentioning other people." Because it is it is like an illness, it is a poison, and alaykum bi dhikrillah. And um, I urge you, or I encourage you, to mention Allah because it is shifa, because that is the cure. All right. So how do we overcome, you know, mentioning other people, talking about other people, whether it be gossiping or backbiting, and so on and so forth, is to mention Allah subhanahu wa taala. That is the cure, right? And even on a on a broader level, um, uh, mentioning other people, talking about other people, is a sickness of the heart. It corrupts and it ruins the heart uh, as opposed to dhikr of Allah, mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, purifies the heart you know, and, and cures, uh, cures the heart. Uh, and so, so this is what is being mentioned here. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a very, very vivid uh, picture of, of, of backbiting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says in this verse, أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتَ That would any of you like to eat the flesh of their dead brother or eat the dead flesh of their brother, you would despise that, you would hate that. Now, uh, backbiting here is likened to eating, um, and like I said, this is very visual and it's, it's, it's very intense, but uh, eating, uh, uh, eating a dead body, right? And not just, you know, we, we often hear meita when it comes to animals. You know, we know Islamically, we're not allowed to eat meita, meaning an animal that was killed uh, without being slaughtered uh, properly, that we eat that flesh, that that meat, that is that is called meita, that is impermissible for us to eat. So uh, so so yeah. But here it's taken to another level where it's human meat, right? Uh, not just any human meat, right? It's the meat of our brother, of our sister, someone who is uh, related to us in faith. So. The, the disgust that you're feeling now, and hopefully you're feeling disgust. If you're not feeling disgust, we got other problems, right? So hopefully you're feeling very disgusted right now. But that disgust that the vast majority, other than like psychopaths and you know all that, the vast majority, like 99.9% of people, that that um, that disgust that you're feeling, Allah wants you to feel that disgust upon backbiting, upon mentioning people's ills and people's evils, or mentioning people's flaws. Right, so that discuss that is what we are we are supposed to 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 uh, to feel, uh, and also a, a reflection upon this 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 part of the verse, uh, Allah mentions uh, eating the dead flesh of of someone who is dead, right, or eating uh, eating the flesh of someone who is dead. Uh, if we were to eat the flesh of someone who is dead, uh, would they know that we're eating their flesh? Yes or no? No. Right, they, they're dead. It doesn't matter to them. Whatever happens to their body or whatever, they're dead. Likewise, a person who is being backbitten, they may be unaware. And actually, in this case, they're they're, un, they're unaware. So, who is the real loser in this case? Who is the real loser? Anyone? The person who is being backbitten, or the one who is doing the backbiting? Right, the backbiter, the one who is eating. The person who's eating the dead flesh. They're, they're the one who's tr the true loser. The one, Jazakallah khair, Jazakallah khair, everyone who responded in the chat. But yeah, the one who is eating the dead flesh, they're the one who truly loses out. Likewise, the one who is being backbitten, they're not the loser. As a matter of fact, for them, 
um, if they're patient, it only increases them in their reward. Um, and, you know, we have the example of the, of the person who comes on the day of judgment. Um, the Prophet ﷺ tells us he comes and he feels very happy about his position. Uh, you know, uh, they come with their qiyam, they come with their siyam, they come with their sadaqah, you know, they gave charity and they fasted and they prayed and they, they're so proud, they're so happy, they have like a mountain of good deeds. Uh, and then a person is brought whom they harmed. Uh, the Prophet them said, uh, you know, they, they harm them, they, you know, they, they, they abuse them. And then what happens? All of this person's uh, good deeds are taken and given to that person until the person's bad deeds run out. And then that other person's bad deeds are piled upon this person because on the day of judgment, there is no currency other than the currency of our deeds. All right, somebody who you back bit, you can't show up on the day of judgment and be like, here's a hundred dollars, you know, forgive me. All right, that's not going to happen. That's not how it works. The only currency we have, the only thing we come with on the day of judgment are our deeds, our good deeds and our bad deeds. And that's the only type of exchange that can take place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So this is why uh, the person who is being backbitten, they're not, you know, they, they're not really losing. And as a matter of fact, they're only gaining. That's why there's a famous story. Uh, the narration that I came across was narrated, narrated about uh, Imam Hassan al-Basri. Uh, I've heard this story about other scholars as well. But, you know, in this story, Imam Hassan al-Basri, somebody was backbiting him and it reached Imam uh, al-Hassan al-Basri that he was being backbitten. And uh, instead of getting angry and upset, he went to this person's house. He knocked on their door and he gave them a, uh, a plate of dates. He said, I wanted to gift this to you. And the guy's are like, what's going on? I was back by, I was talking trash about you and you're going to give me a gift. Uh, and, and yes, he said, I want to repay you because certainly you gave me the gift of your good deeds, right? You gave me your good deeds. So here you have some dates, right? <laughs> SubhanAllah, may Allah protect us. Uh, and, and, you know, so the one who's being backbitten, they're actually gaining in, in reward, but it is the one, uh, the true loser is the one who is, uh, is, is, uh, is the one who is doing the backbiting. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Uh, okay. So then Allah says, Allah, and be conscious of Allah, have the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the reflections here, one of the things to think about is that, um, that having the taqwa of Allah helps us fight this problem, right? So the more conscious of, uh, we are of Allah, the more uh, fearful we are of Allah, the more aware we are of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of which is taqwa, then the less likely we are uh, to backbite someone. Or let's go to the beginning of the process, the less likely we are to, uh, to suspect someone or uh, to make bad assumptions about someone, then you know, following that, as we said, the next step, you can answer. Next step after suspicion is what? According to this verse, what's the next step? Spying, right? Investigating, spying, finding their faults. And then the next step after that is what? Bismillah. Backbiting. Very good. Backbiting. And just making sure you're all paying attention, making sure you're all with me. Alhamdulillah. All right. So, so backbiting is going to, so how do we protect ourselves from this? Uh, this uh, by having the taqwa of Allah. And as we build in our taqwa, going back to the statement of Umar radiallahu an, replacing human beings, right? Being involved in the affairs of human beings with being involved with our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more I find myself, subhanAllah, disconnected from people, the more you'll find yourself disconnected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not disconnected in any obviously relationships, but in being concerned about people's faults and people's flaws, you know, the, the more we were able to dis, uh, uh, connect with, uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and this is why even people who made a career out of criticizing others, uh, in whatever field, subhanAllah, but for me, I uh, look at the, you know, the, the, the um, field of da'wah and Islamic education and stuff. Some people, may Allah, you know, guide them and guide us and may Allah protect us. They made a career out of just criticizing other people, right? That's just... That's just all they do, right? With their time online, instead of, you know, teaching people that which is good and encouraging good and teaching the good, all they do is just talk about other people, talking and talking and talking about other people. Um, uh, SubhanAllah, this is an indication that a person is spending less time in their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and less time focusing on oneself. Um, and the reality is, once again, we have limited time uh, in our lives. We only have 24 hours in a day, right? So, how much of that time goes fo is focused on the flaws of other people versus how much of that time is focused on our flaws in our relationship uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then uh, the last portion of this verse, Allah says, Inna Allah tawwabur rahim, 
surely Allah is the acceptor of repentance, most merciful. And this is a, 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 a subhanAllah, a, a, a sign of hope here for us because, that, because when we make this mistake and it is, it, is, it is human, right? It is human to make assumptions and to let our mind wander and you know, to, to fall into that. Uh, it is part of our humanity and it may happen, but we seek repentance, right? And so we repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that Allah can accept our repentance and certainly Allah is uh, is uh, merciful, all merciful. So those are some of the reflections I had for, for this verse. Uh, I know uh, you, you all have a lot to share, inshallah ta'ala. So let's, uh, let's get to, let's, let, let's hear from you. Bismillah. Um, I'll let Sister Hafsa uh, take the lead. Bismillah. Alrighty, bismillah. So I see the hands rushing up, inshallah. Um, I see a new name, Sahlan Ahmed. Um, you're welcome, inshallah, to unmute yourself and share the first reflection, inshallah, bismillah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير Jazakallah khair. Beautifully recited the next verse, which is actually an awesome verse as well. I was trying to decide between these two verses. Jazakallah khair for reciting that for us. Barakallah fiqh. Jazakallah khair. That was a beautiful recitation. Uh, the next person that I see is uh, Moise from Canada. You're welcome to meet yourself, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam rahmatullah. Moise, we're, we're reflecting upon the verse that, that we spoke about today, inshallah. Yeah. Um... So I was just thinking, I was reflecting upon this, and I think that one of the things that happens when we make assumptions about people is that we're always judging them by the actions that they do. But when it comes to judging ourselves, it's always by our intentions. So because we can't judge someone's true intentions because you don't know what they are, not only is it not helpful, but the only person who knows their true, true intentions is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what I found really um, interesting is there's a hadith in, uh, I believe, Sunan and Dirmadi. I'm not sure if it's Sahih, but it's reported that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, narrates that whoever defends the reputation of his brother, Allah will defend his face from the hellfire on the day of resurrection. So it's a very, um, I guess you can say it's really important, like backbiting and honor and reputation in Islam in general. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful reflection, subhanAllah. And, and from what I understand, that hadith is authentic. Um, but yeah, we don't, you know, we give, uh, we give ourselves all the benefit of the doubt in the world, right? Even if we know we had a bad intention, we're like, well, was, was it really that bad though, right? But when it comes to other people, because we don't have access to their thoughts, we don't have access to what their intentions are, it's a lot easier to assume the worst. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And that's why, you know, that point that I mentioned earlier, uh, it's vital in fighting this. And that is that we remind ourselves that even if I can't think of a good assumption, it doesn't mean that a good assumption doesn't exist or a good reason doesn't exist. Um, humbling ourselves to our lack of information and lack of knowledge, because we won't, we won't, ne we will never truly know what is in someone else's heart. Uh, Jazakallah khair. Beautiful for, Jazakallah khair for that reflection. The next person I see, Oh, I saw a hand and it disappeared. All right, inshallah. I'd love to hear from our host from yesterday, Sister Cynthia. Please feel free to inshallah share your reflection. Go ahead. Assalamu everyone. This is Cynthia. Wa alaikum Great to see everyone again. Yeah, so on this verse, I think it's a verse that a lot of us saw a lot growing up. Like it was a verse many of us are familiar with, but maybe never took time to reflect on. So I like that we're reflecting on it. But something that it reminds me a lot of is how you can literally change the culture of your friend group if you change what you all talk about. So it can be so special that if you're the person to make conversation change, like if someone's about to start talking about somebody in your friend circle or group or hangout or whatever the case may be, and you're the person to like quickly change the topic really nicely, that you can be the person who can like gain the reward of that situation just for changing the conversation. And I think it's like such a oppor great opportunity for you to benefit as well as your friends to benefit. And something I've also found is like in circles of, you know, friend groups can change as you grow up, of course. But I think something so special is how like when your friend groups become more Muslim in character, 
then you're able to see that like you're reflecting on Allah SWT more often, reflecting on the deen more often and speech in and of itself is um, I think a really big like loss when I like having like proper speech in this day and age, like we let a lot of things go or like specific language that we use. And I think the more mindful we become, it's going to really, I think it really stands out in our society to others, like how Muslims speak if we truly try to um, speak well, inshallah. Just like it. Very beautifully worded, Jazakum. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. A rookie mistake, my bad, my bad. On the 20, what is it, 25th day, subhanAllah, uh, rookie mistake. Uh, uh, anyhow, yeah, ab absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for, for, sh for, uh, for sharing that. Um, our friends play a very, very big role in, you know, yesterday we spoke about normalization, you know, what gets normalized for us. Uh, once backbiting and talking about others and, you know, suspicions and, and assumptions get normalized, um, it's really hard to, to get rid of it. Uh, so yeah, our, our social circles panel makes a very big difference. Jazakallah khair. Beautiful. Um, the next hand I see that's a new name is Safiya. You're welcome to unmute yourself inshallah into your reflection. And we'll give you a second inshallah to do so. Oh, there we go. I hear you. Go right ahead. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, the, uh, the I am going to say it reflect on is this it's it talks about the the earth and how you actually see it and you just tadabur, you do tadabur to the khalq and you know it's kind of ibadah so i'm gonna reset this ayah okay uh, 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 sister sophia we're we're mm -hmm. reflecting on the verse number 12 from uh, surah al-hujarat is that the one that you have yeah yeah yeah, that's one I have. Okay, okay. Bismillah. Sorry. Go ahead. Bismillah. Tfaddari. Oh, Sophia, I don't think we can hear you just now. Please go ahead. Hello. Oh, um, do you hear me now? Yes, alhamdulillah. We can hear you perfectly. Go right ahead. Okay. Go right ahead. So um, what I understand, understood from this ayah is actually that um, there are a lot of people in this world talk behind your back say what everyone like see behind your back every time and that like, every time you try to face them they're here just saying like giving you bad negativity but all you have to do is just pray to Allah and knowing that you're getting edgy from them not like confronting them or like abusing them that's not what we Muslims should do and also um, that we should also try to convince them to stop doing this maybe we might get edge from them. And also, <clears throat> we might also, but like, we might also tell them to like share their opinion about not spreading backbiting and stuff like that. So what I, what I would benefit everyone here today, it would be that if you have a friend, maybe somewhere that like, you know who, who backbites all the time or like do something bad, just try to stop them. Because that's what we Muslims are for, to try to stop people and tell them what's good for them. So I hope that benefited everyone. Zakallah khair. Zakallah khair. Thank you so much for sharing that. Beautiful. The next reflection that I want to hear, inshallah, I think Ibrahim is a new hand. Inshallah it is. Ibrahim, go right ahead and mute yourself uh, so that we can hear you. Yeah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have like a similar, like, Thing, like based on what everybody else said but um it, it, it's just our friend groups like everybody in here is probably back but at some point in their life and it's uh just for like acceptance because if you don't and you're like oh you should stop backbiting or something uh sometimes you're like uh, like your friends like your best friend or something uh they're like oh like who, who are you to say or, like what you should say the, the thing is like that right but there's always like two sides to one story like so somebody does something and then you start assuming something based on that right uh and so that destroys relationships like personally speaking i've lost friends because of this stuff uh and yeah i'm making the I, i'm praying that i get better people uh but assumptions and uh rumors and stuff that destroys friendships relationships it, it it's a sin it's yeah, we need to be smart and calculated when we're 
doing stuff like this. That's what I have to say. Zakalakhe, Ibrahim, Zakalakhe. That's absolutely true. Uh, it destroys friendships. It destroys relationships. It, it destroys families and communities as well. Um, and it's, uh, subhanAllah, it's just every time, you know, I personally come across this, uh, it's very, you know, come across a family that's, that's getting messed up or a relationship that's getting messed up, or even sometimes I'll go to a community and they're having like community problems or whatever. You go to the root of it. And often there is so much uh, assumption that is part of that problem, right? One party is assuming this about the other party. And, and that's always in my experience and, and Allah knows best, but you know, these cases that I've dealt with or I've, people have sought my advice, there's so much assumption going on. And then, you know, speaking upon that assumption, like I said earlier, you know, when we were reflecting upon the verse, if it was just assumption and it would stay there, perhaps we'd be okay, but it never stays there, right? It's always then communicated to other people. And that's where the backbiting occurs. And that's where, you know, true toxicity comes about. May Allah protect us. Zakallah khair. Um, the next question, oh, sorry, the next person I see, inshallah, is Rafia from BC. Rafia, you're welcome to send me yourself, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Hope all of this well. Um, so just something quick, actually, that kind of piggybacks on what everyone else is saying. Um, one of the things I heard one of the sheikhs say in the past is one of the worst questions that you can ask a friend or someone you know is how is so-and-so? because it kind of opens up the door rather than saying, oh, inshallah, they're well. When you ask, how is it? If that other person is having a bad day or a bad experience with that person, you're kind of opening the door to spew out all your hate or all your issues about that person. So that's just one quick thing I wanted to share, inshallah. Zakallah khair, zakallah khair. And that's, that can happen, right? Sometimes uh, it depends on the questioner. The questioner sometimes will ask a question uh, in a way where we know the person is just going to complain to us about somebody else, right? Uh, so that goes back to the person asking the question, like we have to ask ourselves, yeah, we can just sit back and be like, oh, I just asked them how, how they're doing. Right. Or how, how's this person? Right. We, I didn't back by, you know, I didn't say anything. I just like, you know, I just asked them, but we may very well, at least on some level know that if I say, Hey, how's, oh, how's so-and-so doing? And they're like, oh yeah, let me tell you about them. And you're like, okay, then the backbiting starts. And in actuality, you know, uh, backbiting uh, the, in act, as believers, we really have three options when, when backbiting is, is occurring, right? Uh, or, well, I should say, here's what, here's what, here's what, our, we, either backbiting is occurring. We, the best option is we try our best to put an, put an end to the backbiting. So we're in, we're in a gathering, people are talking about other people backbiting. We say, look, brothers or sisters or homies or whatever these people are, whoever these people are, I, like, I don't appreciate this. This is not good that we're, we're, we're involved in sin right now. Like we got to stop. Um, and if we are unable to do that, then the, then uh, we have to get up and leave. Right. And if we can't put a stop to, it, we, we, gotta, we can't, we, we're not allowed to sit there uh, and take part in a gathering where backbiting has take is taking place because now we're part of, uh, we're part of that backbiting uh, circle. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, protect us. Beautiful. Next, let's hear from Raisa, inshallah. Raisa, please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum as uh, The part that I wanted to reflect on was uh, we spoke about that back my thing is about uh, eating uh, the br brother's meat or the sister's meat. So usually when backbiting happens, it's usually by the people that are the closest to us, like our closest friends or our relatives. So it's so hurtful when that happens. But in the Quran, the example is of like our brothers are, and our sisters. Like it's directly saying us that the people that are going to beg by to, uh, about you are going to be the people that might be the closest to you. And it might hurt like very bad. And like we have to be, we have to have patience and sabr. And the part where you spoke about the person going and giving the person dates, like, look, I'm giving you dates and uh, I'm happy that you guys, like, sorry, I'm not happy, but you guys did this. But uh, in the Akira, your uh, reward, uh, like your rewards are going to be mine, something. Sorry, I'm stammering. I'm a bit no, no, nervous. you're good. You're good. Uh, that's uh, what I have to say. Zakalakhe. Excellent, excellent reflection. Thank you so much. 
And the best reflections are the ones where you're like speaking so honestly, you're stammering a little bit and you're a little nervous. That's beautiful. It's it's lovely to hear that. Um, the next person I want to pick on, inshallah, is Brother Amar Omar, inshallah. Amar, you're welcome to unmute yourself. And give us, we'll give you a second, inshallah, to do so. Uh, if you're not able to, give us, let us know. And ah, I see it. Alhamdulillah. Let's go ahead. So my reflection is that... Um, you should always make dua for no one to back but you and inshallah Allah will protect you from backbiting inshallah absolutely that's an excellent excellent point dua um, as I said you know this is a human problem and especially when it becomes a habit and getting rid of these issues is not always easy so making dua uh, definitely has to be a really big part of um, ridding ourselves of this issue. Zakallah khair, uh, Ammar. Zakallah khair. I think, uh, take one more reflection, inshallah. Oh, wow. The time. Yeah. <laughs> I, was waiting for you to, I was waiting for you to be like, oh, we're running out of time. And I was like, man, I think she's enjoying the session today. No, so. I've I'm just, I'm just been looking at more and more people. Alhamdulillah. Oh, wow. Subhanallah. Yes. Uh, this is going to be a hard one. But uh, we were missing you in the beginning, Brother Ali Imran. People were asking where you were in the chat. So inshallah, let's hear from you before we close. Go right ahead. Bismillah. Uh, Alhamdulillah. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll take my time speaking. <laughs> All right. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam. Um, I, I wanted to talk about uh, backbiting from the perspective of a leader because uh, I have my Islamic studies background. I took Shu'uba in Baguio City. It's a it's north it's north of Philippines. Okay, it's a two year program that when you graduate from there, it's uh, it's equivalent to a high school diploma so after that you can study abroad you know you take sharia courses abroad like that so in my second year of being a student there in that school the sheikhs made me the, the amir the, the leader of the students there so what i found out is that you know i don't know if it's true for other um Ma'ahid or Marakis in all parts of the world, but our Ma'ahid has become somewhat like a uh, rehabilitation center instead of a, an Islamic learning center, something like that. So if there are children who are kind of, you know, hard-headed or they're not doing well in their school, their parents would send them in, in, in schools like this, stay in schools where they will be disciplined and that. So me as a leader, when I came there, it, when they, they made me a leader, of course, I would implement the rules. I would write names of rule breakers, things like that. And I realized that um, the people who receive so much backbiting are actually our leaders. So instead of us advising our leaders about maybe they committed mistakes like that, or they made wrong decisions, People would rather talk behind you. And instead of making the situations good or the conditions good, you know, it gets worse. And you know, the leaders actually get all the sawab <laughs> from from the, the their subordinates by not you know, confronting them properly. So that's so uh, my advice for those who are leaders, student leaders of the MSA or whatever organization, you know, try to tell your subordinates or the, the people who are, you know, under you to tell them that if you commit mistakes, better you tell me so we can solve the problem instead of them, you know, hiding things from you and it just makes situations worse. That's yeah. all, Sheikh. Jazakallah <laughs> khair. Jazakallah khair, sister Hafsa, for giving the, me the opportunity again. Jazakallah I got nothing to add, man. That was good. That was beautiful. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much.
Alrighty, well done. Jazak milk everyone for tuning in for day number 25. We're closing in, unfortunately, uh, on the finale of Quranic Reflection Circles we mentioned earlier and of Ramadan 360. I do want to take a second, inshallah, before we're, we officially close off, um, just to ask you guys on a personal level, and I know we mentioned this earlier in the session as well, but alhamdulillah, all the programs, all the free things that we're able to offer through Al-Maghrib, uh, all the resources that we're able to offer and the people that we're able to guide is only possible because of all of your efforts, uh, your attendance, your 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 consistency, and your support as well. Um, and alhamdulillah, there have been, uh, especially when COVID hit initially, there was there have been hundreds of people, hundreds and thousands of students who've supported us uh, through a slightly a tougher year than we anticipated as an institution. And we were able to come back not even, not just the same way, but much stronger than we had uh, even pre-COVID in terms of the amount of value that we were able to provide to the community, the amount of free programs, the amount of series, Ramadan 360, the Hijjah 360, family first, everything that we possibly could with the resources that we had. And as an institution, we were very well equipped to, to take things to another, the next level and to bring them through to the online world, alhamdulillah. Um, but it's only possible through the support of our students. And we're asking for that support again, inshallah. Um, I know we've dropped the link into the chat as well for amalgrib.org slash support. It links to our launch good page, which allows you guys as students to help other students as well to benefit from the experiences that you've had to come into classes where they may not be able to afford the full tuition um, and as well allows you to benefit in the same time so that you giving back to the institution enables you to actually get access to uh, classes to full access to Faith Essentials for a year, life, lifetime access to other resources at Hamla as well. So I would love for you guys as we're closing off the month, we're kind of losing uh, time and opportunities are very minimal uh, to help us and today inshallah to come through and help us raise $10,000 towards the uh, launch kit campaign inshallah. You can drop it, you can keep it anonymous if you would like through Launch Good, or you can drop it into the chat and let the community know who and how you're supporting through uh, inshallah. And it's lovely because we've actually had a chance to engage with you guys and we know who you are. We have, we've been able to build these relationships. Let's continue that that way that we've been able to do. And I love the fact, and I was mentioning earlier as well, as, as difficult as online teaching and whatnot is, it also is very beneficial in the sense that we were able to touch so many more people. We're able to benefit so many more uh, individuals and touch so many more uh, hearts than we are able to just in in-person experience alhamdulillah and it becomes a continuous form of sadaqa jariya because you support through one thing we're able to uh, put together a new program or a new course or a new uh, you know facility something that we're able to provide to students and through that you are able to uh, continuously get reward for as long as that course is running for as long as people can can benefit and watch and engage with us as an institution um, and I think Saad you are quite familiar as well with the idea of sadaqa jariya you have several classes now I think you're, you're trying yeah, to break so, records. So look, um, I think I think what you said is is, is awesome. Like that, everything you mentioned. I, I, let me just let me just tell everyone. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to actually say this, but okay. if you guys, right? Let me let me give you some behind the scenes information about Al Maghrib. Uh, I've been with Al Maghrib since 2012, right after graduating from uh, the Islamic University of Medina. Uh, and in actuality, it's not just 2012. I, I was a student at Maghrib when Al Maghrib started, um, the very birth of, of, uh, of Al Maghrib. And, you know, in the early days as a student, you know, when I had nowhere to go seek knowledge or whatever, uh, before I went to Medina, and then, you know, keeping in touch with Al Maghrib as, as, as I was a student in Medina. Um, and then upon graduating, being hired by Al Maghrib. So I felt like my, and it's weird to say this, but my whole journey in Islam has been with Al Maghrib. Right, which is I, like I don't know how to describe that to people, um, and but that's just you know my my journey Islam has always been like associated with with Al Maghrib, um, but so you know when when the when the pandemic hit right and like I said this is like behind the scenes stuff and I, like I don't even know if I'm supposed to share this I might get in trouble for this but whatever you know uh, what are they going to fire me after ten years uh, who knows right. Uh, <laughs> But when the pandemic hit, uh, I know, subhanAllah, um, I was very curious to see how different organizations are going to react to the financial strain that um, the pandemic is going to cause. And it was, it, it, it was very, it felt very good to me to see that Al Maghrib was really, like as an organization and, you know, Al Maghrib HQ, they really had two main concerns. Their first concern was, or and it's not, you know, one is not above the other, but these are the two main concerns. One of their concerns was how do we continue to educate people and provide Islamic education, 
for people now that everyone's quarantined because we're such a big part of people's lives and they're part of their dean and you know we've always been there and now it's almost like we have our hands shackled because a lot of our stuff was on site and so that was their main concern and they're like you know they really worked hard to be like you know we got it we have to continue to provide for the students uh, and second of all they were concerned about their instructors which wallahi to me it, it meant a lot uh, because, you know, some instructors, you know, they're a lot like people like me, like a lot of most of what I do, not all of it, but uh, most of what I do, it's, you know, it's a lot of it is with, with Al-Maghrib. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, there were a lot of people in that space, a lot of imams and so on and so forth, who were struggling. And so Al-Maghrib was like, okay, so how can we help? And so that to me, and this has always been my experience with, with Al-Maghrib, and I'm not trying to overpraise them or anything like that. Um, you know, uh, they don't pay me to, to, to do that. <laughs> um, but this is one reason why I have stuck with Al Maghrib, you know, organizations come and go and you have, you know, new classes and this and that or whatever. But for me, uh, that human connection uh, has always been very, very important that Al Maghrib, and I know sometimes for the students, they may, they may get the impression that, you know, Al Maghrib is a business, right? They're trying to make more money. Like people are like, why do classes cost so much money and blah, blah. And even now I'm sure some people think like, why are they raising money or whatever? But my experience with Al Maghrib has been, yeah, there's an emphasis on finances, but that emphasis is for the sake of providing more for the people and to continue to do what they're going. So uh, do, continue to do what they're doing. So their biggest fear when it comes to like finances is we don't want to be in a position where we can't continue to provide for the people. Uh, and so, and so that, that is why there, you know, sometimes people get the impression that there's a financial uh, push, right? People like they're you know, asking to raise money or like the classes cost this much or whatever it may be. Um, but it's for the sake of the organization. And from day one, uh, Al-Maghrib was established as far as I understand Allah knows best as a not-for-profit organization. Uh, so there's nobody out there like chilling with like millions in the bank account, like, oh, I got rich off of Al-Maghrib. Like that doesn't happen, right? Whatever Al Maghrib makes goes back into Al Maghrib. It goes back into growing Al Maghrib, hiring new instructors. And you know, when I joined Al Maghrib, th there were a handful of instructors. When I left for Medina, I think there was like five or six instructors total. Uh, and now you go on the Al Maghrib instructors page, it's like, mashallah, alhamdulillah, there's so many instructors and so many people that have, you know, not only is it, and it's twofold, once again, it's not only do people have access to these scholars and instructors now. But also these scholars and instructors have a place to, 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 to educate others. They have a place to go. And I, I think I mentioned this in one of, the, one of our um, live sessions was that when I went to go study at Medina, you know, Al-Maghrib was brand new. There weren't any other, other organizations. There was just, a lot of students had this fear of like, what are we gonna do when we graduate? Like, who's gonna hire us? Are we gonna have to become an imam and be like abused at a masjid somewhere? Um, Cause there weren't a lot of organizations, but Al-Maghrib really, uh, set the tone and, and, and allowed for, you know, people to come back and be like, and I could honestly come back and be like, yeah, I work for Al-Maghrib. What else do you do? No, I work for Al-Maghrib and then I do what I want to do, right? Al-Maghrib over the years has given me the freedom to really be myself. If I was working, I'll, I'll tell you, once again, I hate to like bear all right now, right? But something about the last 10 days of Ramadan just makes me want to, you know, talk more, tell more. <laughs> but I know that if I was at a masjid, if I was at an imam at a masjid, most likely, I probably wouldn't able to be who I am, right? In terms of like, just be honest to who I am and, and, and live the Islam that I, you know, for me, because a lot of masjids have a very particular idea of what an imam is supposed to look like, what they're supposed to talk like, what they're supposed to, you know. Um, and so till today, I'm not an imam. Um, I don't have any desire to become an imam. And, 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 and it's mostly because of, I know the challenges that my brothers go through that are imams and what they have to go through. But I'm, wallahi, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm grateful to Al-Maghrib that they've given me the opportunity uh, to be able to teach people Islam in the way that I want to teach Islam and not being dictated by like a masjid board or something like that. So for me, you know, when I say, you know, support Al Maghrib, you know, give as much as you can the last 10 days and the last 10 nights. Um, and if for me, it's, it's very personal because I'm like, for me, I'm invested in the future of Al Maghrib, obviously for myself, but for the, for the khair and the goodness that I've seen uh, over the years. So, so yeah, so that's, that's all I wanted to say. I don't have like a pitch or anything like that. I just wanted to be real with everyone and just tell you how I feel, um, why Al Maghrib is, is important to me.
and yeah, all that stuff about Sadaqa Jariya and, and all that, that stuff is all valid and it's all good. I think Sister Hafsa did an amazing job uh, mentioning all that. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned actually, Sheikh SubhanAllah. I don't think a lot of people know, and I, I know a lot of institutions were hit hard by COVID. I don't think, I think a lot of, like everyone across the board, people and institutions were hit hard. But we were at a point initially last year, especially like right before Ramadan, SubhanAllah, the timing was really bad, that uh, that we weren't sure if we could make it through the entire month of Ramadan. It was like, it was going to be like, okay, by the end of the month, like if we don't have anything coming through. And there were staff members that were do donating parts of their salaries uh, to keep us going subhanallah that we're like hey you don't have to pay me this much this month um, or that we're giving back to the organizations but just so that we could continue that that way until at least we hit Ramadan and then figure out what to do after that it was it was subhanallah I, and I honestly I'm gonna I have goosebumps right now because it was such a strange time that an institution that had been going for nearly 20 years was just with that hit like almost at a point of closing down our doors. And it was only because of the support of people from that Ramadan that we were able to continue continue running as our own organization and then to you know, bring things back. We didn't have on-site anymore. And then we went to virtual seminars and you've been a big part of that as well, Sheikh. Uh, you know, giving students an even better experience in terms of the amount of, the amount of questions that they get answered, the amount of engagement and connection that they have to their instructors and to the community worldwide, as opposed to just within their local areas. That was only possible because of those people who helped us last Ramadan. May Allah reward them immensely and grant them Jannah Amin because that allowed us to continue for the next few months. Unfortunately, we're still not back on-site. We still don't have access to our regular on-site audiences. We've done as much as we can to continue giving back and to have new types of courses, but that used to be our bread and butter for the longest time, and it's still not possible due to the ongoing pandemic for that to, to, to continue. So, this allows us to, you know, bit by bit, course by course, we keep going, but we're still often at times where we're like one month to month as an organization where it's like, okay, this month, okay, thank God, alhamdulillah, this month, okay, everyone's worried again. And it would be such a blessing, not for us, but for the, the continuation of the da'wah to, for us to just be able to, to guarantee that inshallah, we're going to have courses available for our, our students continuously month after month. We're going to have our instructors working on new content. We're going to be able to keep benefiting the ummah now plan for next Ramadan and make it bigger and better and help as many people as we can. Even despite all the difficulty that we've had in the last year, we've been able to give over a hundred thousand dollars worth of scholarship donations uh, to students. So for, for whether it was for virtual classes, whether it was for online classes that was possible literally because of those who supported us last Ramadan so I'm encouraging you guys those of you who are here who've been with us for this journey for so long sorry I keep dropping the same little blurb but the link is the same as well for almagrib.org slash support if you can't give even the minimum giving level give as much as you can it's this is the point where like you don't have don't don't think about the amounts just think about whatever you can feasibly support us with inshallah and as I mentioned before and as the sheikh has mentioned as well is that this is an ongoing charity it doesn't stop at you know the one course it doesn't stop at the one thing I still make the odds for those who uh, supported me who made it possible for me to become a student and like Sheikh Saad you mentioned that it's been basically your journey with Islam it's the same for some of our instructors now some of our instructors started off as you know gangly little young students you know grew up took courses throughout and then graduated Sheikh Majid Mahmoud Sheikh Sinaman Hani are graduates of Al Maghrib who then became instructors themselves as well so that's the next generation that that the intention of the organization is to continue on for decades and decades to become to come and it's our students who are building themselves up to get to that point it's the community that's made that possible but we do need the support to continue uh inshallah in that in that uh, journey and it's still sometimes unfortunately it's still like you know hit or miss month by month so if you guys can support us i encourage you guys if one person can donate a thousand if someone else can donate twenty dollars ten dollars whatever it is you can feasibly afford please do inshallah head over to amalgrub.org support inshallah and be part of that journey with us i want to end us off here inshallah I'll let you guys know, uh, inshallah, how that how, how our, our support campaign is going and I'll keep you guys updated inshallah the next few days. But alhamdulillah, you guys have gifted us an extra 15 minutes and I wanna thank you genuinely, those of you who stuck around, just mashallah, the community is so amazing. Uh, even despite the fact that we're over time, may Allah accept from all of you, your sacrifices of time and sleep and your donations. I mean, Ya Rab. Um, Jazak Malkar as well, Sheikh Saad for making this an ongoing series. It's not easy as an instructor to come on and to be fasting and to go keep going 
even myself, I get backups. You don't, you unfortunately don't have that luxury uh, to have someone just come in last minute, but may Allah accept it from you uh, and, and the sacrifices of your family as well. I mean, we'll close off here. I want to see all of you, inshallah, with Shah Saad tomorrow at our Shukr webinar starting at 2 p.m. Head over to maghrib.org slash webinar to register so that you don't miss out. And we will catch you then. Take care, everyone. Keep us all in your eyes over the last 10 nights. And we will see you tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.